Okay, Mr. Yulovich, you're up. Okay, thank you, Kayleen. Um, happy Tuesday to everybody. Good morning. Um, uh, hopefully you have your agenda in front of you. I'm gonna call the meeting in order and, and offer a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it, for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. Before I move on to uh, agenda division number two, I'd like to, to turn the meeting over momentarily to uh, Stu Glass. Stu? Uh, good morning, y'all. Today, uh, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to recognize a dear friend to the League, uh, to the IRL, and to all environmental concerned. Uh, Representative Kristen Jacobs passed away April 10th after a battle with colon cancer. Her lip, she's, she, she will be missed. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Stu. I, I would also like to uh, add on to that and just just a, an overall uh, prayer to uh, all of you and to uh, any all families that have been uh, impacted by uh, the COVID-19 and the situations uh, surrounding that directly and indirectly. Okay, moving on. Um, Hang on a second, yeah. Bob. Yes, ma'am. I have um I have an announcement I need to read to everybody. Yes, ma'am. So we're gonna go over some quick Zoom meeting instructions. And this is for the official record. Please note this meeting is being recorded, video and audio, including chat boxes. Additionally, all chat conversations will also be recorded and preserved for public record. As we adjust to online meetings, we want to share the following logistical information. All attendees are muted and must be unmuted in order to be heard. For those participating via computer, the raise hand tool is an icon at the bottom of the screen. It can be found in the participants box or in the chat box. For those of our participating via phone, please dial star nine. The meeting host will see a list of everyone who wants to speak and will unmute and call on those individuals one at a time. Members of the public who wish to give a public comment will be unmuted to speak one at a time. To indicate that you want to speak, use the Zoom raise hand tool when the meeting gets to the public comment agenda item. Prior to speaking, all public comment speakers are requested to please state your name and residence or affiliation for the record. Additionally, for purposes of voting during this meeting, um, since we have a very large group with us today, we believe that it would be easier when the chair calls for a vote that we vote via, um, I've got stuck, sorry. <laughs> we, we vote by indicating whether or not you oppose. Probably be less people opposing than, than not on our vote. So please keep that in mind. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, that was a rare moment where you were actually lost for words. Yeah, it uh, is rare. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> agenda item number two is uh, agenda revisions. Uh, if there are any agenda revisions, uh, please note for the record. And if I hear nothing, then I'll presume that, that we can move on to number three. I'll, just give everybody a moment there to uh, look at the agenda. Okay. I'd like to uh, move on to number three and it just very quickly uh, go around and see who's who, like we always do, just see who's um, here if Bob, we can. What, Bob, what I can do is I can call off names that I can see. And then okay. when we get to those calling in via phone, we'll have to have them self-identify. Okay. So I'll start with Kathy Hill, myself, Chuck Jacoby, Stu Glass, Wayne DeFries, Daniel Kolodny, Bob Yulovich, Edward Buskey, 
Chris Hendricks, Anthony Contizi, Contizi, I know I'm not saying that right, Dennis Hanasek, Gregory Wilson, Mike Middlebrook, Bob Musser, Kelly McGee. I have only Ellis on the screen. I'm sorry, what's your name? Mel Bromberg. Oh, okay, Mel, Mel Bromberg. It says Ellis on your screen. That's my <laughs> um, Tom Carey, Laura Lee Thompson, Gretchen Kelly, uh, Charlie Benuto, Dave Fuss, Katie Bowes, Tom Campini, Kevin Shopshire, Diane Wilson, nice to see you. Um, I have somebody from Stetson. I'm going to need to help you help me identify you. That's me here. <laughs> Dr. Jason Evans from Stetson. Okay. Uh, Judy Orcutt, Rob Barron, Nick Murdoch. I have a James, only a James. Matt Mitz, Jeffrey Collins, Lisa Soto, Jim Sullivan. James? Oops, something happened there. Okay. Um, Charlie Volt, Sarah Davis, Claudia Liptestad, Janet Zimmerman, Jeff Beal, Cecil S., Eric Cherist, Michael Meyer, John Windsor, I'm assuming, Mike McCabe. I have a gritter. Theodore Saltos. That, that Chris, scared me. Sorry. I'm sorry? That's that's Gary Ritter. I'm sorry. That, oh. It just came up that way. I don't know why, but anyway. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, let's see. Theodore Saltos. Kristen Knife. Knife. Daniel Huffner. Don Duckart. And it's now moved on me, so I'm losing it. So now I need the um, people calling in via phone to self-identify one at a time. Unmute yourselves and give it a shot. Charles Vogt. Diane Hughes. Okay, and moving on for essence of time. Bob, take it away. All right. <clears throat> uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, if I heard Diane Hughes, it's great to hear your voice, Diane. And Gary Ritter. You all need to get some internets there in Okeechobee. Um, usually I would ask if there was any business, but in consideration of our, our unusual circumstances with, with our round table, um, I'm gonna ask you to hold those. And if you have anything that's burning in your desire, uh, let Dwayne know or, or staff, and then uh, we can address it. But uh, I think you all would appreciate our need to uh, move this along. Uh, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number four, which is uh, minutes of approval. Uh, I'm presuming uh, that all read at, and if if that is true, uh, I'll have a motion to approve. I move to approve the minutes, Bob. That's Chuck Jacoby. Okay. Tom Campenny, second. All right, I, I figured you'd be there, Tom. So uh, we got Jacoby approving and, and, and Tom Kipenny, uh seconding. If there's any comments, if no comments, if there's any objections, please state. Hearing no objections, the- um, I, have a, I have a comment. I have a comment, uh, Kevin Shropshire. Kevin Shropshire, City of Rockledge. Right, go ahead, Kevin. Um, uh, I, agenda item 12, um, I just want to clarify my comment made at that meeting was that we 
I suggested we add a point value addition parameter to the RFP as a yes, no question if the project is able to accept partial funding. Okay. I can email that as a comment if, you, if it's easier. I do recollect that, um, and that was a good suggestion. Um, I suspect that that might have been built in, but I didn't see it clearly. Okay. Um, Kayleen, do you pick that up on the minutes? Um, no, it was kind of choppy. If you could please email that over to me, we'll make sure we amend the minutes. Okay. I do, uh, uh, I apologize. I do have a, just a brief, brief question, uh, Dwayne, on the, uh, on the minutes. Uh, the minutes reference House Bill 4044 and Senate Bill 3171. And, and I apologize if I missed any uh, discussion about that, but is that something you'll brief later or you want to do it now? Bob, I will brief uh, later on those two federal bills. Okay. I didn't hear also in regards to the minutes from item five of public comment, I didn't hear if AJ or Mark Crosley on there, but I was just curious they had both noted at the minutes in in, uh, in February that uh, both their agencies were in the in the process of dealing with grants, and and I did not know if the status of those grants was affected by uh, the uh, COVID nineteen situation that we currently are in. So, um, if if we can follow up with that, Kayleen and Kathy, and this and is Daniel, fine. I can give you okay. a, a quick update our grant process is still moving forward uh, okay. we're in the technical sufficiency period where applicants have until uh, june 15th to get in any missing items and our presentation board meeting has been moved from june to july thank you great all right with without any further interruption by me i apologize uh, I believe that we're good to move forward with the uh, uh, approval of the minutes um, with the aforementioned uh, modifications. Is that correct? Yes. Cool. Uh, item number, uh, agenda item number five, public comment. Uh, I heard a lot of members of the public uh, were present and did not know if any wanted to make a comment at this point in time. Hang on one second. I've got to scan three windows. Okay. And I'm seeing no one, Bob. Okay. Uh, no comments in public. We will now move on to number six and, and turn the meeting over to uh, Chair Stu Glass of the Finance Subcommittee. Here we go. The Finance Sub. The Finance Subcommittee met just a little bit earlier today. There are a number of resolutions. We'll just, we will uh, ask for approval a little bit later on under, I believe, new business. Uh, we did have a review of the audit, and we were very satisfied with the results of it. Bob, that would be my report at this point. Good. I, I applaud you. I, I saw your agenda in the audit report, so uh, very large document that you had to deal with there, Stu. So thank you. Um, oh, it was very well presented by James Moore and associates. Uh, agenda item number seven, water quality reports. We'll, uh, first up is uh, Dr. Chuck Jacoby. Oh, hang on, Chuck. You got to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm doing it. Okay, and you Hold have on. control. And you have control of the screen. Okay, thank you, Kayla. Chuck, Chuck, that looks like my stocks. <laughs> So I just want to walk through some uh, water quality information from beginning of the year. So the graphs are all be very similar. Um, at the bottom are the months, starting January, running up to just the other day. Um, and then the various, these are data from our songs that are out in the lagoon at these stations. Um, so they're providing information on a, basically a continuous basis. Um, so first off, salinity, um, and you might see that Mosquito Lagoon 
and down by Vero, that's where the salinities have been the highest, so the two extremes. Um, in the Mosquito Lagoon's case, it's, it's probably evaporation, the fact that there wasn't a lot of rain. Um, and of course, Vero is more influenced by tides coming in and out of the inlets. Um, the rest of the salinities have been hovering just around the, in the 20 or so mark. Give it back to me for a second, please. Uh, I don't think I had it, <laughs> but I'm more than willing to give it back. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, let's see. I can do it. That's okay. Go ahead. Just tell okay. me in advance. That next thing. Uh, temperatures, uh, as you can see, have been consistent from Mosquito Lagoon right down to Vero, pretty much. Um, so, you know, rising from March on, as it were, up in the sort of upper mid 80s degrees Fahrenheit or just below 30 degrees centigrade. That's, thank you. Next, good, yep. Uh, chlorophyll levels have been pretty low. So, we, you know, we, I'm gonna get, whoops. Uh, right. We've had a fair number of reports that, you know, places like Banana River Lagoon, where nobody's seen the bottom for a while, you can now see the bottom. Um, various places you're starting to see, uh, Calerpa in particular, um, growing, um, that, and that's potentially a good sign because that helps stabilize some of the sediments, which may help the seagrasses. So the last blooms, as it were, kind of faded out in March, and we'll see how it plays with a little bit more rain. Next. Uh, dissolved oxygen levels, because things have been fairly quiet, they've been good. So sort of, you know, around six to eight, pretty much most places. Um, there was a little bit of excitement up in Turnbull Creek, but it turned out that that was a sensor issue more than anything else, um, where DOs were recorded pretty low. Um, so all in all, it's, you know, it's been a reasonably quiet period of time from late last year, um, you know, through now. Next, please. So the 2019 maps are undergoing their final QAQC process. They should be up on the web um, very soon, as soon as somebody can get there and get them up there. Um, and the estimates are that we lost a bit more seagrass from 2017. So that last bar is around 33,000 acres, which is about 42% of what was there in 2007. So we're not necessarily seen a lot of seagrass expansion at this point, um, but we haven't had large losses again either. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions if we can figure out a way to do that. Chuck, Chuck so in, in looking at that bar graph, uh, 2007 is kind of like your benchmark? Well, 2007 was the maximum. 2009 was pretty close. Um, right. A lot of times we talk about relative to 2009 um, because that was the, you know, the last good year as it were. But yeah, 2007, 2009, you know, we had, we had exceeded 1943 um, and people had felt that in 1943 there probably were already impacts on seagrasses. So. What do you attribute that to? The 2007, 2009? Yeah. Um, that was dry. It was a period of, um, it was okay. pretty, pretty dry for a long time. Right. Um, and that's, that helps a lot. Okay. I wish I was going to speculate that, but you're the expert. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Okay. If Chuck's done and no questions for Chuck, we'll move on to Katie. Sorry, I was still muted. <laughs> um, I think I can control the screen. Nope, I can't. So I'll just say uh, when to change. So um, okay. there we go. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys for putting uh, this together. I'm sure there was a lot of background um, planning and stuff that took a lot of work. Um, so my name is Katie Bowes. I'm environmental specialist with Martin County, if you don't know me already. And I'm going to give a quick update for the IRL South Water Conditions update. We can go to the next one. 
So everybody needs, you know, a little bit of positive news right now. And we've had a, a lot of anecdotal um, evidence lately of um, some rebounding uh, critters in the IRL and maybe they're living the quarantine life. Maybe it's because we haven't had much rain. Uh, but just some updates from that I've seen from Facebook and from um, Jackie Thurlow Lippish's blog. Um, we've got some healthy looking oysters that have been spotted all around the St. Lucie River near the Roosevelt Bridge. Some rebounding seagrass was spotted um, near the sandbar at around Sailfish Point. And lots and lots of baby queen conch have been spotted returning to the sandbar um, and that you know, some of these things are anecdotal, but this is um, a lot more prevalent than um, than people have seen in the past years. So, and if you want to read more about and see more pictures, you can go to Miss um, Thurlow Lippish's blog and have the link at the bottom. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So, looking at a general overview of South IRL conditions. In March, we had is, um, an average of zero inches of rainfall. That's reported at the Witham Field Airport. Um, so even though we've had less people on the water and maybe more prevalence of, you know, fisheries and aquatic life, people have even seen um, a good bit of sawfish coming back in the area too. Um, Another plus side is that we've had zero freshwater discharges from Lake Okeechobee. Um, hopefully you can't hear the grass cutters right now. Um, the salinity around uh, Speedy Point and the mid estuary has ranged between 20 to 25 parts per thousand and 31 to 36. So even though we are slightly high um, on that salinity level, we are still seeing um, a lot of our, especially our artificial oyster beds um, we're doing really well. Uh, the pH has also remained, I'm sorry, they're cutting the grass right by where I set up my table and my fiance is teaching class in the other room, so I'm running out of places to go. Um, the pH has uh, ranged pretty well, about 7.8 to 8.1, and this is going from kind of the mid estuary up to Jensen Beach Causeway area, so kind of an overview of the estuary as a whole. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. All right, we've also seen a lot of um, uh, positive environmental, um, you know, anecdotal things in Lake Okeechobee. You can see on the graph on the right, um, that black line is the water uh, shortage management band. Um, <laughs> thanks, Sassy. Uh, and so we've been teetering right above that line and because of that, they've seen a lot of Valsinaria coming back. Um, not so much in the eastern part of the lake where we'd like to see it, um, but you know, any rebounding of seagrass there is a good thing. Um, people have reported a better catch in that area as well. And hopefully, you know, as we're ramping up toward the rainy season, that this can help filter out a lot of those um, nutrients and give us a break for um, some blue-green algae presence. We can go to the next slide. So, you know, even though we haven't had much rain, we are already getting bloom reports in Martin County, um, all of which have been in the Port Mayaca area. So you can see the lake satellite image on the right shows the bloom potential. It's ranged from moderate to high. Uh, I'm so sorry about the grass. Ugh. Um, so you can see the uh, Department of Health picture on the left. They just posted that sign out at Port Mayaka um, maybe a week and a half ago. Um, so they are already kind of warning people that blooms are prevalent in the area. But as of yet, we haven't had any um, reported in the estuary or um, anywhere where we have, you know, uh, you know, lots of Nowhere near the IRL is basically what I'm trying to say. We can go to the next slide. All right, this is also from Ms. Lippish's website. It's very good. I'm giving her lots of plugs today. Uh, so this aerial photo was taken on April 4th, and that shows a blue-green algae bloom in the western part of the C44 Canal. And then the picture on the right shows some of that washed up 
um, near the Port Mayaka Lock and Dam. And that was on Tuesday, April 14th. So it's been about maybe once a week in April, I got a report from the Department of Health about um, uh, bloom. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought I heard someone ask a question. Um, bloom presence, you know, in the lake or just outside of the the um, Port Mayaka Lock. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And this map shows the FDEP Blue Green Algae Sampling Dashboard. Um, the last 30 days, they've had eight sampling events and five out of those showed presence of microcystis. But this sampling point all the way to the right in the C44 Canal, um, that showed no presence of microcystis or microcystin. Um, so we are still crossing our fingers on that front. You can go to the next slide, please. Oh, that was it. Well, does anyone have any questions? I kind of went through that fast, so you would not hear all my background noise, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Katie, uh, Mrs. Bob Yulovich, I'm jealous you got a yard, man. That, that's my job here. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've got several questions. Um, with, until the recent rains, the uh, Lake Okeechobee water levels were, were going down and down. Uh, uh, were you all concerned or was there any potential impacts to uh, effects of that within Martin County? And, um, you know, if I'm asking a question beyond your scope, um, you can pass on that. Do you mean any effects with the rain starting to increase or that it had been so No, low? prior prior to that, any effects uh, reported from any of the, the uh, well users in Western uh, Martin County, Indian River area, Port Mayaka area, any of the folks out there, any any reports coming out in that regards relative to the lowering of the lake level. I know that off and on that the water management district had closed the, the uh, navigational lakes for um, safety reasons. So I just didn't know if um, there was any issues addressed to Martin County for that. Um, no, not that I know of. We don't have too many uh, residents in our county out there. Um, and actually they'd been back pumping water from the C44 canal back into the lake for the I'm last, aware. off and Great. on the last couple months. So okay. I know, I think Palm Beach County has had some issues with, with that, but as for now, um, okay. we've been- I, um, I was looking at, at those photos you were showing and um, it looked like they were on the discharge side of uh, the 310 structure at Port Mayaka. Uh, I know that FDEP noticed a, a blue-green algae bloom out there that now has dissipated, and uh, they just announced that. So with the water, most of the water that's lying within the basin, and as you noted, the 310 gates are actually pushing water into the lake. Um, some of that may be attributed to basin basin runoffs, if there is any basin runoffs given the the low low rain conditions. Yeah, there there hasn't been much uh, basin inflow except for you know when we had those rains maybe about a week ago, but no blooms were reported in the C44 canal. They were all you know the right. first bloom reports came <laughs> in the lake and. And yeah, that could be definitely plausible that um, it could be from some basin inflow, but we actually, the county, we just did a study um, that wrapped up last October and I took uh, sediment samples throughout sites in the estuary and the C44 canal and near the, um, the S80 structure. And we actually didn't find any viable microcystis cells in the sediment. It was still a preliminary study um, and we hope to do another season, but but just interesting point toward what you're talking about. Can that you know population be seeded from sediments in the basin? I mean, in the C44 canal already, um, and is that prevalent before some of that fresh water already gets there? And so far, what we're finding is is no. But that's definitely a good a good point, and I hope to look at that a little further. Is the uh is the uh, 
STA that uh, was under construction, is that in operation and effective, or is that still under construction in the uh, western part of the basin? The C44 reservoir? You're right. Um, it's still under construction. I believe some uh, one set of pumps was turned on, but overall it's not uh, fully operational yet, but there may be other people on the call that could answer that yeah, a little better. Than who's, tracking, who's tracking the success or failure or, or success of, of, you know, the idea was to take water out of the C44 system, park it there and let it attenuate it prior to any releasing. So who's bird dogging that? Is that the county or mostly the water management district? Uh, I think that would be the district or DP would be their okay. primary on that. All right. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Kay, so thank you. No, you're hey, fine. Hey, you're hey fine. Bob. Yes, Bob. sir. <laughs> this is Gary Ritter. Yeah. Um, Gary Ritter? Gary Ritter from Okeechobee? Yes, sir. Yes, I we, know we, him. Yeah. We do, and we do have internet access out here, but um, I it was several months ago that uh, actually Governor DeSantis came down and, and turned on the pumps to um one of the, one of the cells in that c44 area it's uh, mostly an sta part of it um while the other is going into while the other is still in construction but that that is being utilized right now okay thank you gary because the point i was making is is was there any uh <clears throat> with the lowering of the lake and lake into the levels and i know you're more familiar with that than i am at this point uh, I didn't know if there was any uh, impacts to any of the, if any of the well monitoring systems, if they're out there, were recognizing any groundwater impacts to the users, um, particularly in the Indian Town area. Yeah, in in actually, um, Mark uh, Elsner is, um, has a water users forum um, every Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I want to say tomorrow's water users forum will probably get into the groundwater in that particular area. I can't remember if it, yes, it, it is because that's the lower, they do the lower Kissimmee Basin, the Upper East Coast and the uh, uh, south uh, Southwest Coast. Um, and then today, actually probably concurrent with this meeting, they're doing the lower East Coast and um, they do talk about uh, uh, conditions of, uh, of wells in, the, in, that, in the whole area. Okay, thank you, Gary, appreciate it. Glad you're on board. All right, uh, unless anybody has any uh, further questions, either Chuck or, or Katie, um, we're gonna move on to presentations. Dwayne, uh, I'll, I'll presume you're gonna chaperone us through uh, the first one with uh, Dr. Ed Buskey. Actually, I'm going to uh, let Kayleen chaperone this whole meeting. Uh, cool. She's our Sergeant of Arms, so. That's the, that's the best news I've heard. And, and I, I've met her daughter and, and her dogs and everything. So I don't, mess, I don't mess with Kayleen and her family for sure. <laughs> so take it away, Kayleen. Okay. Mr. Buskey, are, do you have yourself unmuted? Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. We're gonna go ahead and start. Okay, um, so my name's Ed Buskey. I'm a professor here at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute and uh, run the research program for the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve. Now, uh, Chuck asked me to make a presentation this morning. I think I included too many slides, probably for the amount of time I have allotted, so some of these I may skip through. But basically what I want to talk about today is the, uh, we can see the title of my presentation is everything is bigger in Texas, right? So this is, uh, we had an eight year brown tide bloom in Baffin Bay and the Laguna Madre. And this was really the first known and documented uh, brown tide bloom of uh, Oreo Umbra Lagunensis, which I believe is the one that also occurs in Florida. Next slide. Do I have control? No. Um, we can give it a shot. Hang on one second. Um, all right, let, let me let me go ahead. So anyway, so we had a 
I think one thing that's interesting about this uh, study, so we had, a, we had an ecosystem study underway in the area where this brown tide bloom began. So I think this is one of the really best documented uh, blooms of brown tide in that we were studying the exact place where it started before it started. We followed it all the way through to the end for, for eight years. And uh, so basically we, we, I think we have a pretty good understanding of the factors that cause the initiation of the bloom as well as the persistence of the bloom. So we were doing a whole series of freshwater inflow studies on the Texas coast. I got to University of Texas in 1986. Freshwater inflows into estuaries and how that affects their productivity is a big issue here in Texas as I know it is in Florida as well. So we would go down in our research vessel, the Longhorn, and uh, carry out a, a, a week-long study once a month. And we did this, uh, in this particular study, it would have been for a, a two-year period. So we had a whole series of process stations looking at uh, rate processes as well as water quality stations, a total of about 40 in this study. Next slide. So uh, things were going along smoothly until we got a really severe freeze. So uh, for Texas, uh, South Texas, where we are, this is a, a very severe freeze. It was below freezing for a two day period. You can see the air temperature uh, graph on the top. Water temperatures went down very low as well. We actually had ice forming on the edge of the Laguna Madre, which is typically around 40 parts per thousand salinity. The other areas that, in that uh, map uh, was in the previous slide in uh, Baffin Bay, salinities typically get up to about 50 to 60 parts per thousand, can get a little bit higher. So anyway, this caused an extensive fish kill as well as, as we learned later, other organisms as well. So a lot of benthic organisms as well as fish were killed off. Next slide. So within a couple of months, uh, actually fairly quickly after that freeze, we noticed the water be began to become discolored, very high densities of very small cells. So normally in the Laguna Madre, the water was fairly clear. It's an area where people uh, like to fish and sight cast to uh, red drum. So normally it has very clear water. Suddenly the water got very turbid, about 5 million cells per mil, uh, very shallow secchi depths and it was a small cell, about four to five microns, uh, non-distinct, uh, really couldn't identify the species. We didn't know what it was at that time. Next slide. So one thing we did record uh, during the water quality is that you can see in the upper slide here, uh, basically we had a big spike in ammonium concentrations in the Laguna and in uh, Baffin Bay. We believe this was due to all the, the fish dying off. So there was a really massive fish kill. A lot of fish were trapped in the lagoon. Normally, in, when the water temperature goes down, they move out to the Gulf. Uh, but anyway, there was a massive fish kill and this caused uh, the spike in ammonium and this seems to have uh, started the, the bloom. Next slide. So uh, one aspect of this that I was really interested in, so looking at the, the balance between the growth of the phytoplankton and the uh, zooplankton that graze on them. Basically what we found, uh, again, before the study is that the, you know, the protozoan grazers, you can see some examples here in this picture, and these are the things that normally feed on these small cells. Their populations, again, hard to tell the different uh, graphs here, but you can see uh, the microzooplankton populations in this top panel were declining even before the freeze. So that was due to the high salinities. You can see the salinities here with that little dotted line in that top slide, got up almost to 70 parts per thousand just before the bloom. So this contributed to sort of a decline in the grazers. So uh, the grazing control was lost. Then we got this big pulse of nutrients and the brown tide population increased very rapidly. Next slide. So, we didn't really know what this was, uh, but I had been at the University of Rhode Island uh, finishing up my PhD and, and a postdoc in 1985 when they had a big bloom of Oreococcus anaphagophorans there, the, uh, the north, northeast brown tide. And so we had some suspicions that it might be a similar organism. Uh, this is just a, an old 
table when we didn't really know what it was for about five years. We just called it the Texas brown tide until we actually got a species identification. Done. Next slide. So what we did in order to uh, be able to identify it and be able to uh, count it better, and particularly we were interested to know, was this something new that had never been seen in the Laguna before? Or was it something that was always around? So Tracy B. Real at our lab uh, developed an immuno immunofluorescent probe where basically you inject uh, preserved brown tide cells into a rabbit, and then you can uh, make this uh, antibody probe. Uh, next slide. So doing that, fortunately, I kept all my old uh, plankton samples, so we were able to go back and look at it. And so typically before the bloom, it was, so it turned out this species had always been in the lagoon, or well, certainly had been prior to the, to the bloom. And uh, typically at about 100 or 1,000 cells per mil, so it was sort of part of the cryptic flora. It wasn't very distinctive, so people didn't really notice it, but it apparently had already been, always been there. We then also did surveyed of a bunch of different sites in the northern Gulf of Mexico as well as southern Gulf of Mexico and down, down as far as Belize. And we found it everywhere uh, from the Laguna Madre to Tamaulipas north in the, the northern Gulf of Mexico. We didn't find it in the southern Gulf of Mexico or in the Caribbean. So again, it's been around. We did find it in Florida Bay, for example, was the only uh, Florida site we, we sampled at that time. Next slide. So anyway, finally we uh, got some of our colleagues to do the species identification. So it was named Oreo Umbra Lagunensis, basically meant the brown uh, shade or the brown sort of umbrella on the lagoon. So one of the main impacts of this, of course, was that it really reduced light in the lagoon and had a big impact on seagrass populations. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the persistence of this bloom, one of the things we find, we did an extensive study of uh, growth rate. We got into culture, uh, looked at the growth rate of this species under different salinity conditions, as well as different temperatures. And one of the characteristics of it is that it can grow in salinities up to 90 uh, parts per thousand salinity. So it has very high tolerance of high salinities compared to a lot of other phytoplankton species. And one other unique characteristic of, of it is uh, some studies done by Hudson D.O. and Curtis Suttle uh, show that it could grow well on ammonium or nitrite, but it can't use nitrate as, as a nutrient source, as a nitrogen source. Uh, next. So then I think the other big factor in terms of the duration of this bloom, so again, an eight year continuous bloom is extremely unusual. It's mainly due, again, looking at the Laguna Madre here, you can see Corpus Christi Bay up there to the north. And if you look to the south, you can see an area called the land cut. So the upper Laguna Madre is pretty well isolated from the lower Laguna Madre, except by the intracoastal canal. Similarly to the north, they built a causeway across the upper Laguna Madre to put a road in, and there's only uh, exchange, again, through the intracoastal canal. So, uh, Circulation with the Gulf of Mexico is very limited. It's very dry here. You can see this uh, Baffin Bay area off to the left. Those are dry creek beds, so there's no continuous uh, freshwater inflow, only intermittent freshwater inflow into the Laguna Madre system. It's hot, it's very windy down here. So uh, again, a lot of evaporation. So again, typically salinities in the Laguna Madre are in the 40 to 45 parts per thousand range and in Baffin Bay, uh, they can get up to 50, 60, or even 70 parts per thousand. Uh, next slide. <coughs> I won't go over this a lot. This is uh, one of my areas. But basically what we found is that all the zooplankton that would normally be feeding on uh, phytoplankton, basically they would eat the brown tide at low concentrations, but it re when it reached a certain proportion of the phytoplankton community, they would uh, reduce their grazing rate. So it was something about this organism that was uh, difficult for the grazers to deal with at high concentrations. Uh, next. So one of the other characteristics of this organism is that it has this really thick slimy layer, uh, TEP, uh, transparent exocellular uh, polymers that uh, we did, for example, we did a study where uh, with a postdoc of mine where we uh, remove some of this material 
using centrifugation and basically uh, the microzooplankton would then eat it much more readily to remove some of this material. And it turns out this material also, for example, if copepods graze on it, it can actually pass through their digestive system uh, unaffected. And basically you can take a copepod fecal pellet and you can start a new culture of brown tide from that. So basically this uh, layer of, of external polymers basically protects those cell and prevents it from uh, being digested, for example, when copepods graze on it. Next. So anyway, again, this is just another example of a study we did that basically when the brown tide is present in low concentrations, the grazers seem to be able to control it. When it's present in high concentrations, in, in our studies, it seemed to be above about 100,000 cells per milliliter. We started to see inhibition of grazing by zooplankton. Next. Next, please. So anyway, just these last few slides are just showing, you know, for example, it also has some ecosystem impacts. So we saw a decrease in benthic biomass and an abundance of macrofauna. Next. No real effect on adult fish populations. In fact, you can see uh, black drum populations increased uh, during this period. Next. But uh, the larvae of uh, marine fishes seem to be very uh, adversely affected. So we had very low concentrations of larval fish during this. So the higher the brown tide concentrations, the fewer uh, larval fish we found. Next. So again, take home messages just that, uh, again, we saw that we think grazer disruption was important in bloom initiation. So basically that freeze knocked back not only the zooplankton, but also the benthic grazers on this, and that allowed the bloom to start. And once that uh, cell density threshold was exceeded, uh, it continued on for uh, eight years. Uh, and again, <coughs> limited evidence that it's directly toxic to grazers, like say the, uh, the red tide cells are. But again, uh, again, it was an ecosystem disrupting bloom. So we had loss of seagrass, reduced benthic invertebrates, and a reduction in fish larvae. Uh, and that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Buskey. Uh, Chuck, thank you very much for uh, having Dr. Buskey uh, join us. Uh, doctor, if, if uh, you hold my attention, it's an excellent uh, presentation that it was. I, I do have a couple general comments. One, most of these kids don't know who Yogi Bear is other than the cartoon character. <laughs> uh, uh, Everything is bigger in, in Texas. Uh, you had 40 water quality stations and four process stations. And, and you know, we got to fight to keep one uh, atmospheric dip, dep deposition station. So, And I know that uh, staff is jealous of your uh, research boat uh, con compared to what we have. I did find it interesting, Dwayne and, and staff and, and Bob Musser, who's on there, is that uh, the, the uh, effect of the causeway in your in your scenario there between uh, the bay and, and the intercoastal is very similar to some situations that we have regarding uh, Indian River Lagoon in particular discussion about redoing the 528 system so uh, that's that's interesting to note that the the uh, lack of circulation and, and the associated benefits with circulation are being negated in uh, in your areas is similar to what we've seen there and I think that might be something Bob Musser that and Dwayne that we may want to jump on to see if there's any uh, if they've knocked down any barriers that we're looking at and uh, with that I'll pass it on to a lot smarter people than me to give you any any additional questions hey Bob this is Dwayne I'm gonna jump yeah. in quick and Ed, thank you so much. It's striking to me how familiar, you know, your experience in Texas and Laguna Madre is to our last almost eight to nine years. I was wondering, you know, if you have any thoughts about kind of the termination, you know, what triggers the, the end of these really long lasting blooms? Is it a shift in water quality? Is it some nutrient limitation? Any ideas about kind of the end point? Yeah, so I, I cut that part out. I'm giving a longer presentation this afternoon, so I, I did leave that out of this presentation. 
Um, jokingly, uh, I finally got some funding from the National Science Foundation to study the brown tide, and then it went away. Um, but uh, in, in reality, it was uh, we had an El Nino year, and we finally got a lot of rain, and it basically just was like you know pulling the chain on the on the toilet. Basically, the whole lagoon system flushed out. We got really heavy rains. The salinities dropped down below hypersaline throughout the whole system, and it just flushed it out, and things went back into balance. But then we did. Since then, we've gotten sporadic brown tide blooms, but never one that's lasted that long. So typically, we get one in the spring from time to time now that then eventually peters out. So we haven't had an extensive one like that, but we still do get brown tide blooms in the Laguna Madre. Thank you. That's great. Thank Bob, you, uh, Doctor. Bob, Jim yes, Sullivan has a question. Hey, Ed. It's Jim. Uh, it's hey, Jim. Giving this presentation. <laughs> um, I did have a question, though. So you said. Uh, when they had the big fish kill, you had this spike of ammonium, obviously, from decaying fish. That, I assume, went away fairly quickly. Eventually, the fish decay. And that these Oreoombra aren't using nitrate. So what is your continuing source of ammonium into Laguna Madre? I mean, how did it feed this bloom for that long? So uh, one, one other, in, so in, in terms of nitrogen, there's, there's, um, Surprisingly, there's actually quite a bit of uh, ammonium in uh, the, the um, interstitial sediments, you know, you know in, in below the Laguna Madre. I'm not exactly sure what the source of it is, but we also have uh, extensive mats of blue-green algae that when they decay, we think they turn into ammonium. So there's nitrogen fixing uh, blue-green algal mats pretty extensively in the Laguna Madre. One other thing that's interesting about uh, Oreo Umbra that we found as well is that it has a, a, a really low uh, phosphate requirement. Now, this probably isn't an issue in, in, in Florida, but so it turns out the Laguna Madre is actually a phosphate limited system. So there is, even though there's no freshwater flow in terms of nitrate and, and, and you know, river flow into the system, there's abundant nitrogen and in fact, uh, Phosphate is the limiting nutrient in our system. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Jim, for that question. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Buskey? That's all I see. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thanks it. a lot. Okay, we'll move yeah. on to uh, 8B, and, and first up uh, is, is Dennis on the monitoring plan. So I think I'm unmuted now. No, you're you not. Unmuted. Okay. So um, are you going to share the screen? I have. It's waiting for you to take control. Okay. So I just. So yeah, I can't see where that is. It should be right on the top, Dennis. It was on the bottom. Okay. It says give up. It says give it up. So does that mean I have it? You have it. Oh, I do. Can you see anything? You can see that beautiful beach in the background. Go ahead yeah, and, well, and try the arrow keys to advance it. Try the arrow keys. Mm -hmm. It says you can control your screen. I don't know why. Oh, okay. We're going to hey, move Kayleen, I don't I'm going to suggest have. as we move forward from here, you control the screen for everybody. Yeah, why don't we do that? I think that's a good, let me, let me set that precedent. Thanks, Dwayne. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll just tell you when to, uh, to advance then. Yes, sir. Okay. So most of you have heard um, the previous uh, two presentations that we've made on the, pro on the project. So I, I go ahead, next slide. So um, I, uh, I'm not going to repeat, you know, everything. Um, for those of you who may not have seen it before, 
Um, the goal is to develop a comprehensive lagoon-wide monitoring plan that identifies existing assets, gaps in the data or analysis, emerging needs, opportunities, and specific recommendations. And there's some other bullets there that you can you can read, you know, as well as I can um, about that. Next slide. Um, a quick reminder that um, it's not just me who's doing this. Uh, we have a steering committee. Uh, there's 14 of us. You can see from the list there that it's uh, agency folks, um, academics, um, some of the other labs. Uh, we have a USGS representative. So it's a, a very diverse group of people that are working together. Um, next slide. So in each of the previous two um, presentations, you know, my last slide was, you know, what are the action items for the upcoming quarter? So in February, um, this is how I left it with you. And those were what we were seeking to do this quarter. And so I wanna report specifically on these activities now. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, you can keep going. Yeah, so we had two steering committee meetings. Um, one of them was in March, and our April meeting became a May 1st meeting. So that was actually just literally on Friday. So this is um, very current information. And um, these are the items that, that um, came out of that. And so I'll go through each one of those. Our next slide. And you can hit hit one more time. Okay, so uh, there there had been discussion that I presented last time to you as to we needed to clarify. You know, are we doing all the vital signs? We clearly knew that we were going to do more than just water quality, but when we first started the project, there was still some uncertainty in that. So at our two steering committees, we clarified, and Dwayne, of course, was a big help here in uh, helping us on the clarification that we will in fact address all 32 slides. There will be heavy emphasis on three of the categories, uh, specifically water quality, habitat quality, living resources. Uh, the other two categories, which are community and one voice, um, the way we uh, look at these may be a little bit different than say water quality, but they also, they also will be addressed. And we actually have um, like different sub sub parts of the committee that will be addressing categories uh, four and five. And again, Dwayne will be heavily involved in that. Next slide. And you can click that. So last time I presented a uh, table of contents and actually that one was the initial draft that we reviewed then at our March 5th meeting. This was actually drafted by Dwayne. He did that for each of the, each of these special projects that are going on. And we also had drafted one here and then meshed it and reviewed it. And it's a more detailed draft that was reviewed on Friday. And uh, if anybody's really interested in that, I'm happy to send it. It's very much a working draft. We intend that it will be evolving um, as we can add more and more specifics. But we really find this useful, you know, kind of as a roadmap. But uh, a good part of this, um, the initial stuff would be things like introduction and background. You know, why are we doing this? And what are, what are things that one should really consider as we develop a monitoring plan and defining criteria, for example. Then the bulk of the report will be looking at the different uh, existing sampling and monitoring programs and how they can all be pulled together. And then the last, the last portion of the report will address things like emergent technologies and maybe gaps in, in what we have and how are we going to possibly address those. So again, if anybody's really interested in that, I could be happy to send it. You can just send me an email. Next slide. So in regards to the criteria, we had a, a very substantial talk about this among ourselves in March and uh, actually spent uh, a fair amount of time on this again on Friday um, because it's, it's really important, I think, before one starts to assemble the document, but also to, to figure out how the monitoring programs work and how they might fit in the bigger IRL monitoring plan, I think the criteria need to be fairly clear. And it's, it's, easier, it's easier to say that than to do that. But there's basically four, four main ingredients um, that we've agreed to. One is, uh, very importantly, obviously, is that it needs to directly link to IRL management and 
Um, we've already mentioned the vital signs. So it's specifically designed to support the CCMP and specifically, you know, it should always link to one or more of those vital signs that we will be exploring. Second criteria really is the program needs to be active. It, it's not something that was done in the past and has stopped. It really needs to be very, very forward thinking because the whole idea is that if you want to show progress toward the vital signs, you have to be able to have a monitoring program that is currently addressing those vital signs. Next slide. Uh, next, next criteria that's really important, criterion that's really important is data quality. So we've agreed that all sampling and monitoring programs must have an established uh, QAQC program if you uh, have EPA funding, it requires specifically a QAPP, um, which most of you are familiar about. Um, and so this is, this is really important. Now, perhaps there might be a, a program out there that currently doesn't have that, and perhaps with, with our encouragement, they might be able to put one together to meet that, that criteria. And so I think, again, we want to be as inclusive as possible. The last point is data accessibility. And many of you may remember that we had a data workshop uh, several years ago here at Harbor Branch, and it was all about uh, how can we, what data are out there, and how can we make those more accessible, and who's sharing data and who's not. And we actually found that that also is not quite a simple yes/no answer, but we do believe that it's important for the IRL monitoring plan moving forward that all the data be that are that are in these programs be uh, freely accessible to researchers, managers, and the public. Um, we sometimes have to consider there may be some lag time for certain types of data in terms of some, some agencies do allow a certain bit of time to publish, but usually it's on the order of just a year or two. But in general, nowadays, when one is funded publicly, you pretty much have to make the data available. So I don't think this is a particularly difficult criterion to meet. Uh, next slide. And. Uh, so as far as uh, the topic of how are we going to compile all these different ongoing monitoring activities, um, basically what we've done is we drafted here a, um, a, an initial uh, very, very high level list of major sampling and monitoring programs. And we've, we've, we've put that in the context of the vital sign tables that I'm sure most of you are familiar with in the CCMP. So again, the effort is start to directly link um, specific items in the vital signs table to specific programs that we are aware of. We have drafted a uh, survey questionnaire um, that was reviewed on Friday, and we made some uh, modifications based on the steering committee input, and we're going to redraft that. Um, and then once it's redrafted, it will be it will be sent out to various data collectors. I'm not going to list the whole program for you again. Once it's done, if anybody really wants to see it, especially if you can help us distribute it to, to, to maybe some groups that we don't know about, um, I'm happy to send it to you. But basically, there's the, the obvious information, you know, the organization, who's the key contact, you know, a description of your monitoring program, details on the type of data collected and the frequency of the collection. Um, we're going to ask um, that the program itself try to identify what vital signs um, their work is linked to. That will help us out uh, initially in our assessment of that. Uh, geographic locations, um, the QAQC program that I mentioned earlier, and the data accessibility. So you can see that the criteria that we are seeking um, also are kind of woven into the, the survey itself. Okay, next slide. So our workshop plans, that's where I was going to roll those in by bullets, but yeah, <laughs> see, uh, are we going to have a meeting like we typically have these meetings um, face to face as we planned here at Harbor Branch in our auditorium? Probably not. Um, we probably anticipate doing this now in August and it's going to be more like what we're doing today, more like uh, my other image up there. It's going to be uh, likely a Zoom type meeting. And that gives us actually a lot of flexibility, I think. And um, as far as the time, we had initially proposed this more like a June meeting. And 
we anticipated it would take a little longer to 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 produce the final report but one one thing that's happened with covid you know all our all our plans have changed all our lives have changed in my case i'm a busy guy in the summer quite a lot and i've had like seven or eight major things canceled so i i decided after looking at our schedules here that we should do the best possible draft report so so we bought some more time there with the idea that um the delay of the workshop would not delay the submission of the draft final report for posting on the NEP website and so on uh, and review by the NEP folks um, by the end of September. So we, we're, we're going to take advantage of the situation um, as best as we can. So the next slide is our action items for this quarter. So we're going to continue doing monthly steering committees. Um, that's what we decided when we met in March. It works out really well. We anticipate our next meeting to be somewhere between the 27th and 29th, so the last week of this, this month. It's a short, a short week with the holiday. Um, we're going to continue to expand and refine those vital sign tables with additional monitoring programs and POCs, point of contacts. So, for example, there was uh, from the last meeting uh, already afterwards, there was two or three people that sent additional information on, 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 on specialized programs that really, I think, do hit our metrics and uh, with contact information and a little description. So obviously we will, we will follow up with all of them. Uh, we're gonna finalize and distribute that survey questionnaire. That's how we're gonna be following up to get that ad additional information. And again, to start to construct that initial um, uh, linkage to our vital signs. And next bullet, we um, separately will be reading, reaching out to the two water management districts because we realize they probably have the most diverse and greatest amount of monitoring going on and, and probably the longest track record. So rather than send them the same survey, we're going to work directly with them um, in a very targeted way. Next slide. Uh, sorry, next bullet. Um, we'll then assemble and review all inputs. Next one. And we will schedule and plan that IRL monitoring workshop. So um, again, we believe that will be in the first half of August. And I think that might be it, unless there's another bullet. I think that must be it then. That is it, sorry. Okay. So, thank, thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Um, I, uh, in listening, I, I'm always, remembering the uh, when you show up at the ballpark and they sell you a program because you can't tell the players without the program. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at this as, as that all encompassing program of, of, of everything that's out there that you've collected. And, and I thank you for your efforts to date on that regards. Uh, that's is a, that's a nice analogy, actually. I never thought about that. You got, you can't, you can't <laughs> I never, that. I never bought yeah. the program because I didn't have the money. <laughs> It yeah. was either program or a beer. <laughs> well, then the next step, of course, would be to have that box score, right? So once you have the program, yes. then you got to track it. So if you remember those programs, they went into, you know, quite a bit of detail and, and uh, you know, as a detail freak in that regard. So I, I that's what came to my mind, and, and I really like it because it is, you can't tell the players without the program. Uh, any other questions or comments uh, for, uh, for Dennis? I see none. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hanasek. Well, really thank you appreciate all. It. Appreciate it. Okay. Next up on the hit parade uh, is uh, is Rob Barron or Marcy Frick. Rob. Yep. Speaking of baseball, here's a. Uh, this is a now appropriate. My background. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm just going to give an update on the habitat habitat restoration plan that we're working on. Um, next slide, please. So just to remind everybody, uh, the goal of the plan is to assess how potential habitat restoration projects are spatially identified and integrated into the overall support for biodiversity and resilience of the IRL. Um, and it's another goal is to identify proposed restoration sites and projects to improve water quality and biodiversity. And as shown here on the slide here, the, the plan will, you can go back for a second, thanks. The plan will also serve as a comprehensive uh, and integrated science-based habitat restoration plan to assist 
NEP partners as they implement restoration projects throughout the lagoon. And the plan will address specific habitat restoration needs and it will provide general guidance to protect and restore IRL biodiversity. And it's also aligned with the CCMP and the, the vital science wheel, which I saw Daniel had as his background. That was pretty cool background. Uh, next slide, please. So the process um, is as shown here with stakeholder meetings with, with uh, council staff and the, the various partners, um, developing a plan scope or the table of contents, drafting the plan, and then soliciting and incorporating comments, and then coming up with the final plan. So we began working with Dwayne and came up with a table of contents that we feel is at a pretty good point now, and we are currently drafting, working on draft one of the habitat restoration plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, let's see here. Yeah, I wanted to thank everybody who provided feedback in addition to Duane on the table of contents. And like I said, it's gone through a few iterations, but um, as of early last month, we felt it was at a point where we could actually start researching and, and drafting the plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the draft habitat restoration plan, um, the priorities within are going to be consistent with the CCMP and have create, um, establish criteria for habitat restoration and site selection, include best restoration practices, cover some permanent constraints for the various kinds of restoration projects, include some cost estimates, logistics, as well as political opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. So while keeping the CCMP restoration actions in mind, and after receiving feedback and reviewing our scope, we decided that the plan will include the following habitats listed here. So the, the meat of the plan will, will, will include these, these habitats, water, water column, submerged bottom, seagrasses, filter feeders, mangroves, wetlands and salt marshes, managed mosquito impoundments, living shorelines, oil islands, human built artificial habitats and communities at inlets. So some of these we're able to hit pretty hard now based on feedback we've received as well as the literature that's out there. And some of them we may not be able to fill in to capacity yet. Um, specifically Spoil Islands chapter, we're gonna be um, waiting on some feedback from DEP. Um, but we'll, uh, I think we're, we're, on, we're on good track to, to meet our schedule. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to main continuity within the document, each of the restoration habitats included in the plan will include uh, um, these subsections here listed on this slide. So for each of the habitats, they'll, we'll cover background status, restoration guidance and priorities, success criteria, short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're currently, as I mentioned, working on the draft document and uh, we got to a point or we're almost at a point now internally where we're, we're going to now um, reach back out to Dwayne and share it with him and hopefully get some more feedback um, before our, our official draft one is due, which as you can see here is at the end of this month. Um, and then uh, we're going to then look to incorporate management conference partner feedback on that draft and then submit a second draft, which will be due at the end of July. And then our final steps to refine the second draft to a final draft and then that that, that as well as our contract is up um, the end of September of this year. So the good news for us is that this um, process isn't slowed down by any means with with our current status and with COVID-19 and everything. So I think we're, we're, we're on a good pace and I think we'll be able to hit our target and we're, we're moving right along. So that's it for me. Thanks for your time. Here I have my next slide is just my contact information or you guys know Marcy as well, if anybody has any um, things, any, any additional resources uh, um, or any expertise on any of the topics that we're gonna be covering in this plan, feel free to email me or give me a call or, with, or reach out to Duane as well and we can chat and uh, collaborate on what, what we've received. So thank you very much. Hey, uh, Kathy, Kayleen, uh, Rob mentioned their next report was the draft was due for July. I was just curious, 
when's our next management board meeting scheduled? August? Yes, it's August. Okay, I did. I didn't want, you know, I wanted to tighten up that gap there when they produce the document so we can get our hands on it. Uh, Rob, thank you. I, I just, uh, I'm sorry, Rob, that you did not have a background of PNC Park. So uh, <laughs> you'll make do with the Phillies. Any questions to uh, Rob from the group? I'm the only group. I see none. I have one. I have one. Go ahead. I have one. Yeah. Can you hear me? It's Mel Bromberg from St. Lucie. Hi, Rob. Is Rob on? <laughs> I am. Okay. Hi, Rob. I couldn't see the table of contents, but I wanted to know in your plan, how are you alerting regional and local governments about the emergence of this plan? And then do you have any idea about the capacity of them in light of their budgets uh, as they exist now to address outcomes from this plan? Um, well, the, the first part, I don't know if that's, if, Dwayne, if you want to chime in, we're working specifically with the council and um, I'm not sure where they want to, how they want to deliver it to the local parties once it's more of a, at a final stage. Um, and then, well, uh, Dwayne, I don't know if you want to chime in there at all before I continue. I'm still on mute there. <laughs> still on mute. Right? There you go. It's gone the wrong direction. I said, thanks for the question, Mel. Uh, once we go through our internal process, we have um, management conference members from the League of Cities. Um, most of the restoration is occurring, you know, within programs that have current funding. Uh, there are a lot of cities that are doing some restoration work as money may become available. And so when we put this out, so if you look at the timeline, um, I'm expecting this will be a live draft document, probably through the contract period and, and may not get adopted, you know, until, you know, in that end of calendar year 20. Uh, because we'll bring it through all of you in the management conference, share with the, the entities that may be not at the table, get those comments, revise as necessary, ultimately get it to the board uh, for their adoption. As it relates to funding, um, if you wait till a little later in, the, in my report, I'll let you know what's going on on the financial side of things. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Mel. Any other questions? I see none. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, the chest of Mel's comments is, and Dwayne's going to get into it, is, is uh, the capability to fund things is, and the sustainability to fund things is going to be a, quite a challenge in, in the upcoming time. We're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Claudia to give us the State of the Lagoon technical report. Claudia, are you there? Yes, now I am muted myself. Uh, I was talking to myself. Um, good morning, I'm uh, Dr. Claudia Lissopad, uh, Principal of Applied Ecology, and I'm going to actually talk about a couple of different projects that we are undertaking um, for the National Estuary Program. The first one I'm going to discuss is the Lagoon Wide Asset Mapping. Next slide. Okay. And this is just the overall goal, just um, not going to go through through the entire project, but it really is the focus of this uh, lagoon-wide mapping effort is to really integrate all the data in, into one repository and empower um, the resource managers, but also help some of the other uh, projects and, and studies that are taking place that you have heard about already. Um, the last quarter, quarter two of this project, we really focused on wetlands, looking at both historic and current coverage of wetlands. And we started um, mapping vacant lands within the Indian River Lagoon watershed. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more examples of that in the following slides. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is part of our task four. Um, and task four was previously focused on water quality and monitoring locations. And right now, Dennis is working on that. So we, we switch our focus to looking at, at mapping uh, wetlands, so some of the habitats, and starting to pinpoint some conservation lands. Um, part of the looking at conservation lands, uh, some officially are, are currently under conservation, but we also wanted to look at, at vacant, um, vacant lands that could be potentially, you know, publicly owned vacant lands that, that could be potentially looked at as, as resources for the future. Um, so here you're going to see some, some examples of maps on the wetlands that we have produced. Um, there's a 1943 um, map that uh, we produced using St. John's River Water Management District, land use, land cover. This comes from the flux. And you can see uh, this, unfortunately, we only have this for the north part of the lagoon. Um, this means uh, in the River County up to, to the north. And it, we just extracted the different wetland types based on their code, on their flux code, on their land use, land cover code. And this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this would be a, a really a uh, useful effort to do for the rest of the lagoon, um, in my opinion, especially when you start looking at conservation, um, targeted um, restoration efforts. Uh, next, if you click next, there'll be other maps showing up. This is uh, the latest coverage of both St. John's. We combined the St. John's River Water Management District with South Florida land use. We extracted again the wetland types uh, and we put it together into one coverage. Uh, there's a couple of years of difference. Um, so mapping, last mapping was done between 2014 and, and 2016, depending on location. Uh, we also looked at other types of classification, wetland classification and mapping efforts. So next, there's like maps on top of each other. <laughs> um, and so this is the FNA. Um, FNA stands, um, it's really the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Uh, from FWC. And this is actually uh, really recent, um, relatively recent 2017, 2018. Uh, and again, we're looking at this, some of these this wetland types, different type of um, classification systems. So they don't really match and we didn't really overlap them. I wanted to on purpose show these as separate maps with different coverages. Uh, and one more, we also looked at, if you click, next slide, next. This is the National Wetland Inventory. Again, a different, um, uh, type of, of classification system. Uh, and in here, if you click next, you'll notice uh, quite a, this was something we noticed for the first time, I believe. You'll notice that we overlaid some, some colors. Uh, you see some pink and some blue. And I can't, I don't really have um, control of the presentation to show you to, to use a, a pointer. Uh, but if you pay attention, there's, you know, a pink square on the west and the rest of it is blue. And what it's showing you is actually the year of mapping. So even though the National Wetland Inventory puts out uh, a seamless continuous coverage, um, the years that they use for the, the imagery that was used for this mapping varies between 1985 and 2015, which is a really, really big, broad range. So it's important to make sure that you know what you're looking at, um, even though this is the most recent mapping. In some cases, we're looking at 1985 imagery. Um, not not current conditions. So um, we currently, so we, we put all these maps, we used uh, the previously accepted um, templates for mapping, and those maps have all been uploaded to SharePoint. They have been submitted to um, the uh, NEP staff, and we are more than happy to share those with the other teams or whoever is interested. Um, we actually were going to go through an effort of uh, looking at the most recent coverage um, from um, the, the flux coverage, St. John's in South Florida, and do minimal, we have a minimal budget for this, but we're going to do a little bit of API looking um, at 2019, 2020, wherever we have the latest imagery and seeing, particularly on the coastal wetlands, do those, are those still there? Are, are we seeing, is the mapping that was done five years back, is it still relatively the same? So we will, We'll uh, definitely classify some of those coverages if we do an API, which means area photo interpretation, so that you know that we looked at the aerials in 2019 and 20. And yes, those, those look like there's mangroves that are still there. So that 
Uh, obviously, with our limited budget, we can't do that for the whole watershed. It would be a great exercise. That would be a whole mapping exercise to do. But we can at least pinpoint some of the areas that we think are important. The next slide. Uh, the other thing we, we started working at, and we also already provided, were maps of vacant land. Um, and we actually uh, did both vacant land um, privately and publicly owned. We made a map that shows everything by classification and how they're zoned. Um, so we have, you know, industrial vacant and residential vacant. But then we focus what the map you see here on the right hand side is really publicly owned land, which is really a more um, uh, easy, easier, I would say, to perhaps uh, put a restoration project in it. Um, and so we focus uh, on dividing this publicly owned land into ownership type. And this is what you can see here on this map. You can see you can be city owned, county owned, state, federal land. And so these maps have been put out. Um, there's quite a lot of, uh, we have different maps for all, for all the areas, regions of the watershed of the IRL. And so this might give a, a perspective on what is there uh, out here that's maybe near the lagoon, might be in a location of interest to put something. Is there some partnership that could be done? Um, so this is, this is the effort we put in. Um, next slide. And finally, in development, we actually are going through now the official conservation lands. And uh, we have requested data, downloaded data where we could. We are waiting for a couple of uh, sources of data to come in. Um, and we'll be able to finalize those maps, I think, within the next month or two. So we actually, um, next slide, I believe I put the schedule. We actually are um, ahead of schedule. We tried to move forward with this as fast as we could. Part of it uh, is was due to, you know, a lot of this mapping effort could be done remotely. So obviously the COVID-19 didn't really um, stop us or hinder us. Um, and um, and part of the, this mapping effort is useful to some other groups and really to the state of the Lagoon technical report as well. So the faster I could ha get my hands on some of these maps being done, the better, um, the better it, it is for the progress of the other reports. And next, I think that's, that's it. I have, um, yeah, so this is where we are. We can click forward. And so we are really just working on the conservation, the conservation lands. Um, questions on this particular project? Thank you, Claudia. I, I really like it when you're trying to parlay uh, using uh, publicly owned land uh, federal, state, and local. So I think that's a good, good reach. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Dr. Claudia? Kayleen, you seen anything? I am seeing none. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Who's back? Who's up next? I'm, I'm up next again. So now I'm wearing my other hat, uh, State of the Lagoon Technical Report. Um, and uh, next slide. So this again, the overall overarching goal is to complete a science driven technical report of the Inner River Lagoon uh, that is supposed to really, you know, cover multiple objectives. And uh, one of the objectives is, is really to also guide the next CCMP update. So our focus with that in mind, our focus of the last quarter has been really to fine tune the table of contents uh, to ensure that the indicators that we are selecting and how we're going to organize this report um, uh, align uh, closely with the vital sign wheel that you have seen um, several times mentioned here. Um, we, uh, next, next slide, I'll talk on task three. Um, so if we really, this was part of our task three on this, identification of vital sign indicators and how we identify those uh, indicators that we wanted, how we wanted to organize uh, was based on um, the CCMP objectives, uh, looking at some of the, the past historic NEP reports and looking already at in the river living specific literature. So we decided to separate the Narragasset was, was one example we've been looking at. We have looked at several other uh, states um, of estuary reports that have been put out. And we decided to separate, to group these indicators into three big categories, uh, stressor indicators, condition indicators, and um, healthy community indicators. 
and those have been um, in, uh, integrated and organized into a proposed table of contents. Uh, we had, uh, we have had, we have gone probably through three different iterations already on the table of contents. It basically is an effort that keeps building and becoming more fine-tuned as we actually start finding the data and organizing the data. Next slide. Just to give you a little bit of an idea how we, we did this, and we just submitted um, a synthesis memorandum that includes this alignment and includes a lot more information. Um, but what, how we aligned the vital signs with the proposed technical report was, was based on you know, a couple pages. We have a chart that looks at each of the big sections of the wheel, uh, for example, living resources, and looks at each of those um, uh, different indicators, biodiversity, species of concern. And then we are aligning that with where are we going to address this in our technical report. We're going to address it in their biological community and diversity and biological. So in certain cases, so these numbers 3, 4C, 5C, what you're seeing here on the screen is actually our table of contents. And so we, we provide an updated table of contents with this, with this table that does the crossover. So you can look, okay, we have this vital sign X, Y, Z, uh, where, are going to, where are they going to address this in their report? And in many cases, it's in multiple sections. And, um, and because a lot of these are really truly interconnected. So we, we might be looking at commercial and recreational fisheries, for example, and we might be uh, discussing that under the background of history and looking at the history, how it was used, how it's progressed through time. And then we might be looking at uh, some of these fissures in terms of biological community and diversity and also under economic health. So we are separating some of these into, into multiple goals, approaching these a little different in the technical report, but, but every single uh, vital sign is, is going to be discussed in the report for trends. So next slide. So, you know, how we organized um, the table of contents and how we intend on, on starting the draft of uh, the uh, technical report is basically for these three families of indicators, as I call them. Um, we mentioned that I just wanted to give you a, a, a perception of how these are organized underneath of each of these big groups, these families. Under stressors, we're going to have landscape and physical, water quality, biological stressors, um, like invasive species, um, et cetera, uh, climate change. Um, then under condition indicators, these are the resulting conditions that we need to measure to know how the lagoon um, is doing. And, and there's some different water quality indicators in there. We're going to look at benthic habitat, biological community, wetlands and living shorelines. Under healthy community indicators, we are looking at this um, where, where the lagoon health and human health uh, touch. So we're looking at water quality for recreation, things that people are looking for to feel that they are healthy. Uh, economic health, um, and then sustainable distinctive communities. So this is uh, the literature review data synthesis we put out. Uh, we just sent this out last week. Our goal is to have some input from um, the staff. And if they are okay with us sending that to the steering committee, we'll be sending this to the steering committee for review and input, uh, and hopefully um, put out a final um, uh, review uh, synthesis memorandum report. So next, next slide. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, more perception of what's in that synthesis uh, report, besides the alignment on how we're going to proceed with the report and how it aligns to the vital signs, we actually start going in depth for each of those uh, indicators we discussed uh, for stressors and condition and economic health. And so we have metrics that we already are suggesting um, ways of basically they allow you to measure how we are doing uh, trends through time and um, related uh, categories and sections um, and then some keywords and literature review and where we're going to get the data. So we started the effort of um, knowing where to get the data on, on looking at some of the literature. We, we are really now undergoing ramping up the literature uh, data research and this is where we really will need a lot of help, particularly for them that, that uh, pack. Um, and so we have put out these, these appendices, and probably for those of you who got my report, you see they're quite extensive. We have an appendix that's usually a couple pages, two, three pages for each of the different kinds of indicators. 
So we have, I think, 10, 12 different appendices in this report. Um, and it already identifies our effort. We know we need to get data from these organizations. Uh, this is the type of literature we found. Um, and then from that, we want to build. And, and this is what we want to specifically target uh, different experts on some of these indicators to ensure that we're not missing and they can they help supplement some of the literature, the research that is out there regarding some of these um, indicators. Next. So timeline, you can click, keep clicking. We are really now in the data source of starting the data source identification gaps. Um, so our goal, uh, like I said, if we have this, this synthesis memorandum that will guide our data acquisition and literature uh, review efforts. Um, and we'll be reaching out to the steering committee to get input from the synthesis memorandum, make sure that the table of contents sound like it, it's aligned properly with the vital signs, um, that we're not missing some major indicators or metrics we could be looking for, um, and, um, and targeting, reaching out to the TAC for specific indicators to get uh, the actual data or information on, you know, there's so-and-so publications that are really relevant and recent for this particular topic. And I think that's it. Um, oh, that, that's what I just talked about. Um, so the gap analysis that we are working on, I think that will be um, key for the next step. And I think that will also, the idea is to guide future efforts, research funds, um, analytical research and, and, and analysis efforts. So as we went and put this synthesis memo and particularly these matrices that specify where the data and what kind of metrics we want to look at, a lot of them we knew, well, that's probably doesn't exist, but it's pie in the sky, but it'd be nice to have it. So it wasn't based on what we know we have. It was based on this is what we should have. This would be what it'd be nice to have. Let's see if those data exist. Um, some of them we were very, you know, I'm, I'm not very optimistic, but this is where the data gap analysis will come in. And, you know, we, we figure we want to do something inclusive. And even if we don't have the data, then we know we need to progress towards that in the next few years. And I think that will be enough questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I, I did like the comment you made about uh, where Lagoon Health and Human Health touch. Uh, I, I like that. Okay, any questions for Dr. Claudia on the uh, uh, State of the Lagoon report? I am seeing none. Okay, Lisa, you're up. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Hello? Okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the boater's guide, um, working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWRI office over in St. Pete. They've been doing a tremendous job of providing the tools to collect the information. Uh, we also got matching funds and a, an, an incredible in-kind support from the Florida Inland Navigational District. Got to give a shout out to Janet Zimmerman for a rock in the south under the lagoon. I think she collected all the data needed for two counties. So thanks, Janet, for your efforts. Uh, with that, let's move on. So this quarter, we really focused on collecting the map data. We were hoping to have this accomplished by mid-April, but that we were unsuccessful, but we're very close. Uh, we're uh, just to remind everybody that FWRI has an extensive database, and a lot of the fishing piers along our coast were already in that database. It was just a matter of finding whether they're still there or not, because some of the data are old, and confirming that the facilities are still uh, in existence and whether or not there are new facilities. So we're looking for fishing piers that FWRI already had to confirm their existence, and then we were entering new information on marinas and restaurants uh, that were accessible by boat. Next slide. The survey tool that was developed by FWRI was a, a there's a, a phone based app that was created through a ArcGIS uh, application called Survey123. You're looking at the instruction guides, the first page of them for the two different surveys. One was the fishing pier survey, there was one created for each of the five counties, and then there's the uh, marina restaurant survey. There. there was just a single survey created uh, that somebody could put there. You see the, the QR codes down there at the bottom. You could just hover your camera over that QR code and it would 
download the survey onto your device, onto your smartphone, and then you could you can enter you can enter the data from there. FWRI uh, did seven online trainings, and we were able to involve 27 of our steering committee members in those trainings, and then we kind of sent them off with the tools that they could use to collect survey data. Some people had had, had some challenges dealing with the online app, so we also created a, a print survey so that you could you know, also print out the survey, fill it out, and then scan and send it back to us, and we would upload it. Next slide, please. So when you open the tool, you, you, would, you would see something like this. These are just a couple of screenshots to give you an idea of the, the great work that FWRI did. Uh, you'd open your, your Survey123 app, and it would give you your selection of which county, and then you'd click on Volusia County, for example, and that next slide in the middle, your next screen in the middle of the slide there would come up, and you'd pick one of these are fishing piers. They, had a, they have a lot of fishing piers in Volusia. So you'd pick which one you were working on, open it up, and start entering the information. And there are a couple of pages you see there on the right. That's what the, uh, just an example of what the survey would look like. Next slide. Uh, FWRI also created this tracking tool so that we could keep up with who was doing what. If you click on any one of those dots, you can see if the survey was completed, who completed it, when it was completed, and if all the data were entered. So one of the jobs that we had over here at MRC was to keep up with who's doing what and try to communicate effectively with our team that was out there to let them know what still needs to be done. Everybody has access to this. Uh, and uh, through this tiny URL website that's there on the slide, the, the login and the password are the same for everybody. So if you're interested in just going out there and looking, you've got the, the address right there. Uh, and you can see you know, what's being done and what's not being done. On the map there, the dots are fishing piers and the squares are either marinas or dockside restaurants. Next slide. So this is kind of our status as of the end of April. We still have some work to do. This is the fishing piers that have been surveyed. You see that all of them have been completed in Indian River and St. Lucie County. We've only have four left to do in Martin, uh, up here at the north end of the lagoon. Uh, we need uh, to get 10 completed in Brevard. Some of those we don't have access to. Mm -hmm. We're reaching out to some of our partners over at the Air Force Base to see if we can get access there and um, up at uh, NASA. And then in uh, Volusia, we've got 19 left to complete up there. Next slide. And then the marinas, this is just the number of marinas in each county that have been surveyed. And I, I guess implore you all that if you want your marinas and your restaurants to appear on this guide, we need, uh, we need your help getting more marinas and, and restaurants surveyed or they're not going to appear. We are going to, um, oh, go ahead and do the next slide. So this is marinas and these are the restaurants that have been surveyed and added. So we do not have an existing kind of benchmark of how many restaurants are out there. We're just depending on you all uh, to know which restaurants exist and make sure that they're getting surveyed. We do have the list of what's been surveyed that we can share uh, with, our, with our committee members. Next slide. And I think that's it. So we, we need to complete the rest of the surveys. We don't have a, a lot of them left. Uh, we, and we're going to start writing content, and I'll just remind you that our, the content is going to be focused on clean boating practices, clean marinas, and point people to resources where they can get additional information. Next slide. And that's it. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Lisa. I, I'm, I probably said this before, but this always reminds me of that old uh, trip away trip ticket it used to take on trips before all this... Uh, updated so this is the uh, electronic aged uh, trip ticket I, I really like it um, any chance of us digging a canal to uh, Laura Lee's Dixie Crossroads to make it uh, a marina <laughs> sounds good to me yeah. or just driving up there yeah any uh, any questions for, uh, for Dr. Soda I am seeing none Thank you, Lisa. Gonna, again. Hey, Bob, this is Dwayne. Yeah. I'm going to jump in really quick. Go ahead. Uh, we've allowed a, a lot of detail in this meeting to make yes, sure that the management board sees how much work is going on uh, with these contracts and, and also to make a request. Uh, in the future, we're going to cut these down to, you know, where are you and what you need. Uh, but 
we wanted to have more detail in this meeting because we know that these contractors are reaching out to our members for information. And the more information you provide in a timely manner, the easier it is for these contracts to move forward. So just wanted to thank everybody for being responsive. Uh, if you've got strong feelings, ideas, you know, now's the time to weigh in before we've got a draft product uh, for review. So thanks everybody for helping us move this forward, um, but continue to do so as we, we need to fill out these gaps in information. So thank you. Okay, that being said, we're gonna roll into uh, agenda by item number nine, old business. Dwayne, you're up. Yeah, and I'm gonna apologize in advance. It's a classic story. It's been dead quiet at my place for the last six weeks and I've got a construction crew drilling upstairs. So if you hear background information, my apologies. Uh, 9A item is one you've seen already. Um, in the abundance of being uh, transparent, we wanted to bring it back to your recommendation. Uh, last board meeting, uh, you recommended that the Sewell's Point stormwater project uh, be considered by the board of directors to move forward and to have staff identify additional funding because it was in that funded list or partially funded list. Um, as part of our budget, Dan will go through that in a minute, uh, we found additional funds uh, that were not impacting our reserves. And so uh, we're asking uh, an action from uh, this board to recommend inclusion of that Sewell's Point project in the business plan um, and pursuant to the budget. And then uh, we'll go to board of directors meeting on uh, Friday uh, to move forward with contracting. So that's the requested action. Uh, Dwayne, correct me, did not the council approve this at their last meeting? Yes, they did. But, you know, because we were still being directed to identify whether dollars existed, we wanted to bring this back to you as a management board because it has a fiscal implication to just, you know, make that recommendation again from you should you decide to. And, and that will finalize action on Sewell's Point, bring it into the business plan. Okay. Uh, um, excuse for me. For those. Bob? Uh, yes. Tom Campini has his hand up to speak. Uh, uh, if Tom can wait a second, I'd like to uh, preface his discussion. Uh, I I call. I would like to call everybody's attention to the, the document and to uh, Daniel's uh, uh, very detailed and excellent notes included in the agenda behind uh, resolution. 2020-03. Uh, my comments, and they may be relative to Tom's, is that um, we had a lot of discussion at the last meeting regarding the integrity of the process. And this was in competition with partial funding to uh, the FAU project. And uh, my concern was then and still is is <clears throat> the the uh, process but also to make sure that no no other project got jumped and that that this was duly ranked and and it's in the proper position in the queue uh and that nothing no other project was sacrificed to benefit this project okay let's let's let tom speak uh, just like you had just said I was against this, but now that it's come forward and it's come forward, uh, I'm going to say better late than never, and it's in the process, I'll, I'll move the uh, recommendation. Do we have a mo uh, motion by Camp Nelly? Is there a second? Camp Penny, buddy. Camp Penny. <laughs> Camp Penny. You're not wearing your mask. I hear that's mandatory in Stewart. Okay. They got to got a move. Motion from the other TC besides Tom Carey. Uh, is there a it. second? I will second it. The other the TC, other TC will, will second it. Thank you. Hey, is Bob? there any objection? Yes. Bob, we have another. Um, Kevin Shopsire wants to comment. Go ahead, Kevin. 
No, I was just going to make a motion. Thank you. Kevin, we didn't understand that. I said I was just going to make a motion to oh. make my conclusion. Okay, we got you. He was going to um, make a motion to move. Okay, so we have a motion, motion from Tom and a second from Tom. Uh, any any discussions? Uh, if you're not seeing any, Kayleen, then we'll ask for uh, if there's any objections. Right. Are you seeing any objection? I am seeing no objections. Then uh, under agenda item 9A, old business, the uh, recommendation as pro provided in resolution 2020-03 uh, passes unanimously. Excellent job, Daniel, on the details. Uh, moving on, agenda number 10A, uh, resolution 2020-02. Uh, All right, so resolution 2020-02 um, brings forward our uh, cash balance, fund balance from uh, audit that we just had completed. And that brings it up into the fund balance beginning of year. Um, so Kayleen, if you can move the screen. Sorry, I apologize. Next, there you go. So this is the detail. Um, that first decrease you, you see there, I'm gonna kind of explain why that went down. Um, I had identified before audit was complete some projects that were under budget or um, unencumbered balance that has been now included in that fund balance from audit. So that's why I brought it into that other line item and took it out of there in revenue. Um, the audit increase created that other expenditures increase. Um, it's pretty straightforward. There was no other changes to any other line items within that uh, amended budget. Um, I want to preface this by saying, you know, if you see at the end of the year fund balance of $5,627, that is every single expenditure and all those projects that we brought forward in that detail are expended. That does also include our contingency reserve of this year, which right now is sitting at $69,548. So if we get to the end of year, we don't spend any of that, that will come into it again, our next budget that you're going to see for 2021. And that's really all there is for this budget, just reconciling uh, audit fund balance. Thank you, Daniel. Another good job. Um, is there uh, a motion? I'll move it. Tom Kim. Move, move, moving from Tom. Is there a second? I'll second. Second, second from Stu. Uh, any discussions? Kayleen, nothing? I'm seeing nothing. Okay. Um, all those who object signify by yelling or raising your hand. No yelling or raising hands. The motion passes unanimously for uh, resolution number 2020 02, amended budget. Okay, moving right along. Are you still up, Daniel? Yes, sir. So uh, next one is resolution 2020-03. This is uh, per Florida statutes, a final budget. Um, in our last meeting back in February, you guys all got a chance to look at our tentative budget that we passed. And so this budget uh, identifies a couple of things. If you go into the detail, next slide. So we identified, I identified doing my reconciliation of audit, a couple of projects that um, since audit have, you know, at the end of the year finished, uh, that was the, um, there was two projects. You had the West Wabasso septic to sewer phase two came under budget by $68,219. And our city of Felsmere, uh, they contacted us and decided they were gonna withdraw that project. So that freed up another 50,000. Um, that money is being brought into this final adopted budget for uh, the fully fund schools project um, with $93,973 of that. The remaining $29,922 is going to go into our reserve, which will bring our reserves up to $88,376. 
there are no other line item changes as you can see in this detail it's pretty much just bringing that money forward from those projects and applying it to Sewell's Point and our reserves no other changes so Daniel let, let me ask you a question um, that's a significant under budget on Westwood boss septic the sewer I guess they didn't get the participation they were expecting no, they did. So when the contractor sent in their invoices, uh, the way our contract is structured, it is a percentage based or a maximum amount of the award that they asked for. So if they completely expended every single dollar or went over budget, they would get the full $200,000. Um, okay. Their contractor came in under budget on some stuff. So based on the percentage of the invoice, it ended up only being about $100,000. Uh, $30,000. So that $68,000 was never requested uh, for reimbursement. Okay. Did, did Felser give you a reason for their withdrawal? Uh, they were having budgetary issues within the city and they okay. you know, decided they couldn't do their match or their, their portion of the project. They had to use it uh, elsewhere. So they, you know, they sent us a letter uh, signed by the city manager saying that, you know, unfortunately they, they can't do this project as requested at this time. Um, they may put in a request for proposal at another time, but at this point they, they said they just can't do it. So um, okay. that's why that was withdrawn. You know, I understand the value of the process and, and um, uh, maybe in future discussions when we have a situation where West Wabasso actually um, does something that's, that's positive in, in their fiscal responsibility, perhaps some way of rewarding that or, or parlaying that into to something. I don't have an answer right now, but uh, their, their fiscal responsibility and their, their due diligence to do that under budget uh, actually has benefited others. So uh, I just want to, on the record, uh, note appreciation for their work. Okay, is there a... Uh, are we through a motion on this? Didn't we just do a- Mrs. Mrs. Vance, I'd like to move that we approve this budget. Second. Okay. Um, we have a motion in the second. Any discussions? Kayleen? In the not heard, not be heard. This is it. I'm I, sorry. I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any place to hold my hand up on any of this. And I, so, I think that's been my impediment to enter into. There's no place on this particular screen that allows you to hold your hand. Okay, but but I am able to converse. That's okay. Thank you. Are we are we waiting for comment from Ed, or are we ready to move? No, on? I don't. I don't have. I'm fine. Okay, thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Kayleen, if we're cool, then we'll just ask for uh, any objections to the motion. Yes, sir. Are we good? I am seeing none. Okay, therefore, the uh, motion as presented on uh, agenda item 10, 10C, I mean 10B, uh, is, is passed unanimously. Now, moving on to uh, 10C, Kayleen, this is yours. This one is mine. Okay, so um, the small grants program finally came to a tentative close. We received a total of, <coughs> sorry, multitasking over here, um, a total of 37 proposals for a total request of $138,173. Or $173. As you all may remember, we only had $25,000 in this program. CAC met last Thursday, reviewed all of the proposals together as a group, um, and they came up with seven recommendations. Those were emailed to you Monday, I think, a couple days ago. Came as a separate um, thing away from the agenda. And we are asking for your approval of what CAC has gone through. Is there a motion in support of the CAC recommendation for small grants program? I'll move it. Kevin Rupshire, second. I'll second it. 
All right, so we got uh, Tom C. from Stewart uh, and Kevin from uh, Edgewater. Seconding Bill, it. Bill Kerr. Okay, Bill Kerr. Who'd you pick up, Kayleen? You pick up Tom and, and Bill Kerr or, or, or Tom and Kevin as your second? Um, I picked up Kevin as my second first. Okay. Well, we're glad to see your face, Billy. All right, so we have a, a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? I'd like to discuss. Okay, Mel, go ahead. Um, I'm, I looked at, I looking at the seven, it's very Brevard County heavy. There are three projects there that are, that are allocating or proposed to be allocated to Brevard. Is there anything that we're going to do to try to rebalance that, or we're going to? I know the committee made the recommendations based on the matches and the and the scores, but again, we've got three Brevard County projects, no representation from some others. Yeah, I'm going to hey, defer. Go ahead, Kay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and defer to Kathy and let her answer that for me. Um, sure. So. Uh, as we always do, we default to process mail. And with all of our projects, the best projects are the ones that get funded. Okay. <laughs> but there's no, is there a balance? So I guess the answer is no, we're not going to rebalance because the recommendation okay. from them is what the recommendation was based on the, um, the proposal criteria and the process that they went through. Now, I will say. Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Uh, let the board know the other discussion that you all had. Yeah, I, I was just going to do that. Um, the CAC at their next meeting has decided to revisit the proposal criteria uh, to make sure that we are hitting. So the intent of the small grants program was for teachers and small community groups like Boy Scout troops, um, schools, uh, to obtain small grants for little projects that would help move their balls forward. Um, so they're 500 to $5,000. Uh, and in going through what we received this year, so out of the 37 proposals, quite a few of them were, you know, larger nonprofits. We got multiple requests from universities and things of that nature. Um, so CAC is going to really revisit the proposal criteria for who's eligible to apply next time. And that's going to be the focus of their August meeting. OK, thank you for that. Uh, if, if in light of that, um, is there anything we can do as management board members to um, get increasing um, participation? I know I've tried in, in our county. Um, to, to get increasing participation. I know there were four submitted from St. Lucie, uh, and I see they didn't get funded. But um, is there anything else we can do to um, get increasing participation via the management board on this once the, once the revisions are done? Yeah, just, um, you know, once the, the RFP comes out, just please publicize it. You know, the, it's, we ask that every year, and, uh, you know, our submittals are going up, so we're getting more applications, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a lot more non-governmental organizations involved in the lagoon, so it's it's trying to reach out to them and make sure they participate too in submissions, et cetera. Yeah, and and you know we're we're four people, but we have to rely on all of you as the bigger you know the larger board in our larger community to really help us get the word out. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, Kayleen. I notice in in ten uh, C that there's two motions that are going to be required. So the first motion presented will be to recommend the uh, Indian River Lagoon Council Board of Directors accept the management conference's recommendation and approve the final ranked list. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. So is that the motion that, that we had? That would be the motion we had from Tom and Kevin, the second from Kevin. And that's the motion that's presented before the council, the board at this point. Is there any objection? I mean, is there any uh, objection to that motion? Um, Bob, hang on. I want to jump in and just recognize that Greg Wilson and Kelly McGee have recused themselves from this vote for conflict. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, 
we need to make sure on all these motions that if there's a, a conflict that uh, the that has to be so vocalized. Thank you, Kelly, and Greg. That being said, uh, aside, is there any objection to the uh, the, the motion uh, that's before the board at this time? I am seeing none. Okay. So that motion passes unanimously. In regards to the second motion, the motion is to recommend that the uh, Indian River Goon Council Board of Directors accept the management conference recommendation to fund the top proposals contingent and consistent with available funds and budgetary authority, authorize staff to negotiate and enter into contracts with those applicants, which are on the list as, as on your screen at this point in time. So no move. So moved by Ed, Ed Fielding, uh, second by, is there a second to that motion? I will I'll second. Second. Well, second by Stu Glass. I'm just seeing what I see on my screen. We have a motion, motion by Ed Fielding, a second by Stu Glass in regards to the motion that's before the council. Is there any discussion? I mean, for the board, any discussion, Tom? No, I was seconding it. It's fine. Okay. All right. If there's no discussion, is there any objection to the motion uh, before the board? We I'm, good, Kayleen? I'm seeing none. Okay. Therefore, the uh, motion to recommend that the board of directors accept the management conference recommendations to fund the top proposals contingent uh, has been approved unanimously. Moving on to 10, new business 10D, categories and priorities, Dr. DeFries. Uh, 10D is uh, the beginning of our process to look forward to fiscal year 2022. As many of you know, we try to get moving on this early so we've got sufficient time to allow responders uh, to a full RFP to have adequate time you know, around the holidays to respond. And so, yes. Kayleen, if you could give me the next slide. So previous years, you know, and we've had water quality with a focus on nutrient and pollutant reduction. Um, and that has been our primary category, you know, with the largest dollar commitment, habitat restoration, uh, last year, we separated that citizen engagement in restoration piece, uh, which we believe worked very well. And then science and innovation, which in the past has been kind of a broad call uh, with a, a generalized focus on nutrient reduction, pilot studies, and then ecosystem health, human health. and. Before I go to that next, the staff recommendation, what I wanted to do is to get a sense of where you all felt we need to be looking at um, as we move to 2022 uh, consideration of RFP. And we've had a few individuals start thinking about maybe it's time to start looking at science and innovation and real, really narrowing down to some specific questions. And then others who have really liked the broader call because it allows for uh, the review committees and the management board and deliberation to decide where you wanna put your funds. So question number one to you all um, is, do you wanna continue to move forward similar to what we've done last year? And then one additional recommendation that my staff and I feel is quite important is a separate RFP uh, to get that 2016 economic study that was initiated by the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council updated. We've got 25,000 in this year's budget. Uh, we didn't find any partners to increase that to a level where we could move it forward. Uh, the budgets you just passed you know, move that 25, we'll move that 25 grand in next year. 
but we're thinking the only way this is going to happen is by RFP and with some committed funds. So with that, I'd just like to see where you all are feeling. If there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, we'll bring this back in the August framework. And if there's confidence within the management board and then in our upcoming STEM AC that we're going to continue on the path uh, with the priorities that we've had, uh, then you can, you know, take up that uh, re that requested motion. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to turn this over to you and discussion. I, I call the, the board's attention to the document that was included in the packet, which uh, lays out in, in, in detail the uh, categories that Dwayne's noted relative to uh, water quality, habitat restoration, community-based science and innovation, and the update of the 2016 economic study. Now, my my thoughts was is that uh, that was the Treasure Coast. I believe Mike Busha took the lead on that, Dwayne, with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. And uh, just just talking out loud, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but that would sep simply be something that if we go out, would seem to be the base, uh, the foundational base from which we would uh, build the uh, revised and newer version of that. That's correct, Bob. And in fact, I have reached out to Treasure Coast uh, on two occasions over this last, I don't know, six or seven months to get a sense of whether they wanted to take the lead on this. I have not gotten any clear direction on that. Um, obviously, you know, it was their methodology with DEO funding and also participation by the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Um, and so, you know, at, at this moment, you know, there is no clear interest that I'm aware of to move this forward. Uh, one other consideration, uh, which is something I'm deeply involved in as you all are, um, taking this up in 2022 will allow whoever might do this work in the scope of work to analyze the negative impacts of COVID-19 on our regional economy. And so I see some, some value of keeping this as a priority, whether or whether we don't do it as a full RFP. Okay, I just, yeah, I didn't want to lose, uh, lose the uh, foundation that was built by Treasure Coast, but uh, I'm a little disappointed in their lack of response to date, but uh, um, I'll just shut up and let others talk. May, may I? Uh, um, go ahead. Ed. Um, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I think the way we've been doing this has been very, very helpful, very, very good. I like to see us continue at least for another year and see what and see what develops because I think we've got a lot of projects that would not have been funded if it was a more narrow range. So I'm all for leaving the process the way it has been for the last couple of years. Thank you. Ed Fielding. Please, two things. I, I would think, yes, the broad range is useful, but it certainly doesn't impede having a broad range to also say, and here's some, so here's some specific ideas. That doesn't mean anybody's got to jump on that idea. But that might mean somebody would like to take up that, that idea. So I think we can integrate and do both. That. On the Thank you. economic study, um, how that worked is Mike, yes, he, he took the lead and he brought Central Florida in. Now, now uh, Treasure Coast has a, um, they're not as, far along in their process. And so it may well be that Central Florida needs, we need to approach them about taking the lead and then bringing Treasure Coast Regional in that way. That, but I think Tom might not be, Lanahan might not be um, prepared to, to assume something of that nature but it certainly, I can talk to them if you want, hey, whatever. But I think it's useful. We need this information, not so much that it helps the water quality, but it helps get money to water quality. 
Amen to that, Ed. Amen to that. Kevin, you're next. I just wanted to say that I agree with Tom about keeping the previous priorities. Um, I like the way we've been doing the scoring, and I know it's come up previously in meetings about um, when we say something like, and not to sound mean, but to uh, ensure the most important high value projects. I, I don't want to be meeting before about the possibility of excluding smaller organizations. And if you focus on things of that, uh, to use that quote, it might end up with certain universities obtaining uh, most of the funding as opposed to a diverse set of projects. Um, just my two cents. Dwayne. Thank you, Kim. Um, I, I wanted to just echo Ed's comment. Uh, this was not reluctance on Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council because of their leadership change. Um, I think they just weren't quite ready to jump into a big project like this. So even if you recommend this pathway, it's my intention to continue to seek potential funding for this, this year, as we move through the next several months. And as we get into August, and remember we wouldn't be issuing RFPs until fall anyway, uh, we can provide an update. If I'm lucky enough to secure funding in advance, you know, we wouldn't do an RFP possibly. We may do this as a full partnership, uh, but we wanted to get the ball rolling just in case. So we're working well ahead of this 2022 uh, fiscal year. As you all know, everything we're projecting, not just next year, but in 2022 is gonna be contingent on what our revenues look like. That being said, I'm gonna call for a motion. I would move that we accept the priority list that's been proposed with the understanding that the, would you put that back up, please, on the screen that provides, providing whoever has the screen, yes, no. Oops, wait a minute, there you go. Yes, okay, the, the, that we also, uh, certainly science and innovation, nutrient reduction, ecosystem health, yes. But then if there are some specifics it could just be incidental, just say, and there are some specific suggestions of da da da, whatever they are. Staff recommendation as well for the economic study, yes. So that's the motion is that we continue to support those studies with that minor modification. Thank you, Ed. Uh, second to that motion? I'll second it, Tom Campenny. Um, Tom Campenny, sick. Bob okay. Kelly McGee has her hand up to speak. Go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to second the motion. Okay. We'll, we'll let you do that because Tom's been, you know, all over the place. So we're going to, um, uh, the chair is going to overrule Tom second and let Kelly McGee have a second. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion's been made. Second's been made. Uh, any, any uh, discussions? Any objections? Kayleen? looking I'm seeing nothing from what I can see okay in regards to the motion in front of the board uh, at this time in regards to uh, new business 10 D as in dog uh, as presented uh, and per the motion of uh, Ed Fielding second by Kelly McGee the motion passes unanimously okay we're gonna move on to uh, new business 10 E coastal resilience partnership dr. D uh, Tenney is uh, two formal uh, associations that we would like you to consider. Um, we have been working closely with both in an unofficial capacity. Uh, so the first one um, is with the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership uh, that has been funded by NOAA uh, through uh, the Southeast Ocean Ob Observing System. Uh, I have been sitting in those meetings uh, and actually have accepted an advisory board membership, but we want to formalize our relationship with them. And the idea for that one um, is that, you know, working together from Virginia all the way down to Puerto Rico brings a lot of disaster preparation, disaster response, and disaster recovery expertise into one room. And uh, our last 
several meetings have been all about COVID and hurricanes combined. Uh, so I'm going to bring both of these and you can take the actions uh, one by one since they are by resolution. The okay. second one is more localized. Um, there has been a, a very formative creation of the East Central Florida Regional Resilience Collaborative uh, that has been initiated first by the East Central Florida Regional Pla Planning Council, now involves many cities uh, and DEP. And so they, uh, because we have done so much work in coastal resilience planning, and you all in August will see the new climate change adaptation report uh, that's just being finalized. Uh, they felt like we would be a really strong partner. So we've got two resolutions. Uh, you need to take them separately, Mr. Chair, since they are by resolution uh, to join formally these two associations. And by way of just a little FYI, it looks like down in South Florida, a similar collaborative is being formed you know, down in the St. Lucie and Martin County area. So we may have another partnership down there as that, you know, begins to mature. So with good. that, I leave it to you all. That's good news. Uh, okay, let's, moving right along here in regards to uh, 10E, uh, motion number one. Is there a motion to 2020-04? motion. Tom Carey makes a motion to move. Kevin Shropshire second? second. Kevin seconds that. Uh, any discussion? Comment. Comment under Ed Fielding? Please. I think this could, it, well, Dwayne, as you've mentioned, you've been involved in this quite a long time. But I think what we would want to move towards is how might we, uh, as a group then, more fully, more completely, improve water quality. Not, not just ours, but we want the water quality and we want this improvement to touch out into the Caribbean too, because then they can, they can give us some backup and some help. That, and I, when you talk to those folks all the time, but that's where I see us going with this, is not, not just standing back and, and saying that we're, we're going to have uh, some resilience and look at a hurricane kind of a situation, but rather looking at the sustainability of our water systems. That's ours, that's South Florida, that's Caribbean. So that's where I would see us. Yes, that's where Excellent. I would see us. Excellent point, Ed. Okay. Any other comments? Kayleen, you see any? I've got one. I've got Go one ahead, as well. Hi. <laughs> I just want to know in terms of um, resiliency around infrastructure <clears throat> and infrastructure that affects our lagoon, how um, how that is being discussed or looked at within the, uh, the, the committee or the advisory board that Dwayne's on. That is actually the same direction Ed Fielding was going, Mel, and I'll give you yeah. the, the brief part of this and I'm going to finish the story under my director's report. Okay. The language is changing now in a very important way, both at the federal level and at the state level, to look at water quality infrastructure improvements, not only just as a resiliency component, but also an economic driver of, of jobs. And, and I think you're going to be really excited as a management board when you see the report that Randy Parkinson is completing on our adaptation plan because it, it supports that very agenda that the best way that we can prepare you know for these shocks and some of the stressors is to do this water quality infrastructure improvement you know and also the community resilience improvements so, uh, and I'll mention this as it relates to federal funding during my report, but you're, you're absolutely, both of you are right on target where this, the big value of this comes in. Kelly McGee. Okay, thank you. Kelly. Kelly. No, I didn't have a comment. 
Sorry. <laughs> Kelly, can you talk up a little bit, please? She said, had no comment. Oh, she had no comment. Okay. Yeah. No, I had to. I had to move Kayleen to uh, charge my uh, iPad. I'm looking around, following your advice. Uh, all you guys should be able to see is dead animals on the wall up there. All we see is your fan on the ceiling. Go ahead. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so uh, based on those comments, then uh, are we good to go with with the 2020.04? Uh, did we have a, uh, did we hear, did we have a motion on that? There was Kate? a motion, yes. So we had Ed and, and was it Ed and Kevin or Tom and Kevin? Tom. Yeah, it was myself and Kevin, Tom. Okay, Tommy C. Okay. All right. And did we have any objections uh, noted, Kayleen? From what I can see, no. Okay, so in regards to 2020-04 uh, to join the Southwest and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership, <clears throat> and based on the comments that have been provided, the uh, Mansion Board unanimously passes such uh, said resolution. Moving forward to 2020-05, uh, 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 as uh, Dwayne had provided the information and, and apparently very relevant to um, some of our previous discussions uh, about reaching out into other communities. Uh, is there a motion to recommend the council adopt resolution 2020.05? Move to apply, move to accept. Uh, Ed Fielding moves to accept. Second. I'll second that. Tom Carey seconds. Okay, any discussions? Unless Kayleen tells me. Uh, any objections? I'm seeing none. Therefore, uh, based on the, on the motion in the second, 2020-05 to join the East Central Florida Regional Resilience Collaborative Infrastructure Technical Advisory Committee uh, has been approved unanimously by, by the board. Moving on. Okay, item number F, and I'm hoping you all are as excited about this as I, uh, at the initiation of our emergency order from Governor DeSantis, uh, staff and I got together as part of preparation for this meeting, looking at our budget, and we asked ourselves a very simple question. Is there a place for the National Estuary Program and the IRL Council to actually be actively engaged in, in doing something either in COVID response or recovery? And back in 2018 fiscal year, uh, we had authority from the board of directors uh, to initiate um, some internships with funding. Uh, we did one at the time, uh, but we didn't have enough staff or time to handle others. And so we still had money, you know, in that budget that it carried forward. Um, and we've been leaving it in reserve um, for that possible use. And so what you have before you in your board package is the following recommendation, that we look at some immediate needs, short-term activities that could be delivered by a summer intern and, and within the time frame of a you know, summer internship. And so what we're asking is for your recommendation to the board on Friday uh, to authorize staff to do the following, to immediately put out a call for summer internships. We have sufficient funds to fund 10 individual internships. Each one has a very specific scope of work deliverable. These are not to be, you know, awarded to agencies or organizations. The individuals that would be available for these internships are any individual, whether it's private, public, or independent sector, who's been furloughed or laid off 
who's been working on Indian River Lagoon issues, um, and they'll need to bring a letter from an employer that you know they are in that furloughed or laid off position. And our intent, besides getting the work done, was to provide some modest assistance to some human beings who are in our community, you know, of Indian River Lagoon fellows, uh, to see if we can bridge a little little funding to get some work done during this crisis. So I'm, I'm willing to take questions. Um, you can see the list of 10 internships with the scope deliverables, uh, but it, it, it would happen quickly should you recommend and the board authorize on Friday. It's our intent to get this on the street, you know, within a week to 10 days and to get this system moving forward uh, to see if we can put some people to work. I see that there are two blue hands on the bottom of my screen. Yep. Tom. Great, thanks, Kayleen. Um, on the um, county specific um, research for the um, tourism sites, heritage, blah, 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 uh, it says within Volusia County or any county. Uh, Duane, is that the entire county or is that just within the um, Indian River Lagoon watershed? Uh, we're going to let that one be entire county because the goal here for that specific, and you notice we broke that into five separate counties. Actually, we, we may have had more than five. I'm trying to remember offhand, but the idea was to assemble the data and then we would take that data and then, you know, probably find a way to GIS map it and then send it right back to you and say, look, we've assembled kind of all your places. You know, the county can distribute that raw data to your tourism development folks, your economic development folks. You know, we'll be funneling some of that data into the voter's guide where appropriate, but it, it kind of shows the gems. So. Technically, it's watershed, but we're going to take sites that are outside of the watershed since so much of what you have is, you know, it, all those waters are connected anyway, whether it's groundwater, surface water. So, no, we're not going to just narrowly limit it. We'll let those interns get what they can find in the time frame they've got. Beautiful. Thank Stu. you so much. Stu. Stu I just want to make a motion to fund up to 10 internships. Okay. I'll second. Two glasses made a motion. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second that. Tom mm -hmm. Carey is second. Uh, under com the only comment I have, Dwayne, is uh, oftentimes when I hear the words uh, summer intern, I think of, 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 of you know, college break or, or high school break that's doing that. But this seems to be more specific to. Uh, a group that has specific skill sets that for whatever reason, mostly the COVID-19 reason, have been fur furloughed from, from their position that may have been extremely involved and instrumental in that. So that's the only confusion I had was the use of the word summer intern. I know in, in some of the, the PPP programs that, um, some of that money that was received dries up by June 15th or July 15th or so. So uh, I just, I'm just expressing my ignorance in, in that and not, not expressing a, a, a non-support, but just wondering if the use of the word summer uh, adds any uh, confusion to the situation. Bob, we'll, we'll make sure, I, we, maybe we add professional to that. Uh, we've got a pretty good description of who's available. Um, just to give good. you an idea, I had a phone call and I did not disclose this discussion to the individual, but it was somebody who had been furloughed from the federal government who has 30 years of science experience on the lagoon wanting to know if we, we get any wow. work. Wow. So we're expecting to see some, you know, some, we may see a whole spectrum. The requirements here you can see in the backup is that they can only choose a maximum of three. So any single individual can apply for three of the internships based on their expertise, but only one individual per intern 
and these would be 1099. These are contractors, not okay. employees. And so okay. they we're not going to obligate council or the NEP uh, other than, you know, the, the contract, the 1099 contract. Payment would be uh, at half time. So, you know, mid internship, uh, when they give us a update on progress and a mid report, and then final report would be satisfactory delivery of the deliverables, they would get the second half. So right. two payments of a thousand each, one midway, one at end of contract. You know, I, I like I like the idea. I just uh, make sure Carolyn's on board with that. Yeah, we've already reviewed it, but we'll add professional and make sure that the guidance is very clear. That you know the choice will be based on expertise and experience in choosing these interns. Thank you. We got a motion by Stu. Is there a second? Could I ask, please, and may I ask, I, I, I didn't make a copy of this particular backup. Let, Ed, let me get a, let me get a, a second to the motion, then we'll have please, discussion. Please. Uh, we had a second by Tom Carey. Okay. All right, go ahead, Mr. Fielding. Thank you, sir. Would you just, what, what are we expecting these individuals to do. I just, I didn't make a copy of the NF. Thank go ahead, Dwayne. I'm going to go pull my sheet for that particular item because there's 10 internships. So I'll go really quickly. So intern number one will be a, a full data spreadsheet of all the projects in the annual business plan since the beginning of the IRL council, but to cross-reference with total phosphorus, total nitrogen uh, reduction. So we can tie our performance to nutrients across the board uh, where appropriate. Intern number two is a historic timeline and a graphic of NEP milestones since the beginning of the program in 1990. Intern number three is clean tech. There's two deliverables expanding our company database on clean water technology companies, and then preparing a standard PowerPoint slide presentation so we can begin to get standardized information on what those companies would do. Intern number four would be economic value, and that would be evaluating the last five years of our business plans and EPA work plans quantifying the number of volunteers, volunteer hours, part-time jobs, and full-time jobs that were supported by our contract work. Then item number, or intern five, six, seven, eight, and nine, all relate to that question that Tom Carey had about nature, heritage, and cultural tourism. So there'd be five interns, each working within respective counties, to develop an inventory of all Indian River Lagoon related nature, heritage, and tourism sites, including background information that's useful to the TDCs. And then item no or intern number 10 is something that Kathy uh, and I discussed a long time ago. And it's, it's somebody to actually write 20 stories, brief narratives, about Indian River Lagoon myths and mysteries. So some of those misunderstandings we hear all the time that we would have an individual actually deliver those stories for website um, and also communication pieces. So that's the 10 deliverables. Really Dwayne, I'm, very useful. Very useful, I, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, Dwayne, I'm, you know, we're pushing one o'clock, so I'm gonna call a question on this one. Uh, any objections to the motion as, 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 in regards to the uh, professional interns? If there's none, any no objections, then agenda item 10F uh, for for the uh, solicitation of professional interns, as described, uh, is approved unanimously. And then uh, we're going to roll in now to the executive director's report. Aileen. Slide. Oh, yep. Sorry. 
There you go. I'm going to start from the bottom, Mr. Chair, so I can do this quickly. Uh, the yeah, first that's the, the optimum word there is quickly. Yeah, the first group you, of uh, bullets, you can see we have a lot of projects underway. I just want to highlight one in particular. Uh, our One Lagoon website is active. At the end of May, the IRLcouncil.com uh, will be sunsetted, but anybody looking for that website will be immediately brought to One Lagoon, and now it's accessible for ADA, so we are in compliance. The rest of the reports are all actively engaged um, and moving forward. Uh, to just talk to Mel's question earlier, I'm working on a finance plan that will be uh, distributed to our finance subcommittee next week. You know, that's all of the kind of the big picture options of how do you finance $4 billion? What should our communities and our partners be looking towards? And we're working with one of our contractors to actually build a grants list so we can help all of our people find grants. So if anybody's got question about any of those, just call me directly or send me an email. I'm happy to give you an update. Okay. The big news is in the top three. So the Florida right. legislative update is really stay tuned. Uh, the House and the Senate has not sent the, the budget to the governor yet. The governor has really two options, either, you know, well, actually three, except budget is presented, uh, execute, you know, his power as governor to veto, to try to address some of the COVID impacts or possibly go to a special session. Uh, stay tuned. I'm in discussion with all of our board members um, in advance of this meeting on Friday uh, because we are in uncertain times regarding uh, our funding for next year and also 2022. And uh, we are taking every contingency uh, possible. Uh, but we are also, and I want to let you know, we are not going to drop the ball on any of our commitments. All of the deliverables that staff promised for this fiscal year will be delivered, you know, on or before the end of, you know, September. So we're not, you know, we're not stopping any work because of COVID. I do want to give you a quick update on the federal legislative side because it relates to this idea of job creation, water infrastructure. So our reauthorization bills, and Bob, you mentioned it the very first uh, part of the meeting, are, are on the table right now. So House Bill 4044, Senate Bill 3171, uh, both provide a significant increase in our reauthorized amount. Uh, there's another, there are appropriation bill for 2022 uh, that right now would bring our annual revenues to 750,000. And WERDA is also coming up for its two year reauthorization. Um, we have been talking very closely to congressional staffers. I'm working directly with the Association of National Estuary Programs we have every indication that even though COVID is the dominant debate up in Washington, that uh, these bills are going to move forward and we're going to try to not lose momentum between now and November in particular on reauthorization. But the new news is that Congress is contemplating uh, a, a fourth infrastructure stimulus bill. Um, we were asked whether the National Estuary Program had the wherewithal both structurally to handle uh, congressional funding should it become available. And so we mounted a very quick response, which I was involved with, to the House and Senate majority leadership and minority leadership and basically said this, the National Estuary Program stands ready to help in any stimulus package for water infrastructure should one arise and we were asked to throw some numbers out. And so the, as an example, we said $10 million for each of the 28 national estuary programs, $100 million for the competitive grants program as an example. And, and many of us provided some examples of projects that could start immediately, you know, with large job deliverables or, or, or 
return on investment. So stay tuned. I mean, that's a real long shot. I don't know where that goes in the big picture, uh, but the National Estuary Program is actively in play in Washington for federal funding. And then when we see you all again in August, whether it's a Zoom meeting uh, or if we get to phase two, we may be back to face to face. Uh, we should have a better handle on where we stand, you know, with our revenues from our partners in the interlocal, uh, from the state of Florida, and, and hopefully from the, the federal side. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. I'm moving around. Uh, in regards to what you said, Dwayne, uh, that was a rather long answer. I would have just said, hell yes. So, uh, also, I, I tell everybody, Kayleen goes to great effort to uh, send out a, a monthly update of what's happening. Uh, it's very valuable to read. Encourage you to look at those and read those. Uh, before I ask for any final comments, I, I just, for those that are still on, uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, for you mothers, um, shout out to teachers. My daughter's one. Everybody's really uh, appreciating what a teacher brings into our lives now, including sanity from our kids. So with that, I will ask if there are any uh, closing comments from any of the board members that are still on the line. If I may. You may. Please, thank you, sir. I, th I think part of the management process is, as Duane has just expressed, we're always looking forward, looking forward. What, what kinds of things and how can we prepare to look forward. In that regard, I think we need to look forward to issuing a uh, uh, renewals or bids for our administrative services. So the, the legal and the accounting, uh, and we may have the best deal and the best folks, but I think it's useful to always get feedback and get, okay, here, here's, this company will do this and that firm will do that. I, I think it's always useful to do that. We have found that in most cases to be extremely helpful. Thank you, that's, that's a, that's a well-timed comment. Thank you, Ed. Any other comments? Kayleen, seen anything? I see nothing. If Mike McCabe's still around, he's always the one that says the motion to adjourn. He unfortunately what? left us about an hour and a half ago. Yeah, Mike had to leave. I'll fill in for him. Tom Carey right. moves to adjourn. Very well done. Very well done. Thank you, Tommy. And I'm sure Tom, Tommy C., the other Tommy C., will second that motion. He also had to leave. I'll well, then, where's... Okay. God bless you all, and uh, please take take care of yourselves. Thank yep. you. Stay use, safe, everybody. Use well, Yuli. Yes, you as well, Dwayne. Bye-bye. Thank okay. you. Thank you, staff. You're great. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everybody.